Welcome to it. I thought I'd change it up a little bit this week. That was intense. I, I'm selling... No, it, and grammatically awkward. You know what this nature. reminds me of? There's a show on TV right now, Halt and Catch Fire. It's actually a really interesting like, insight into 1980s computer culture. And you got these three characters. Well, one is like the, the overbearing... Uh, salesman, which you were such. Then there's like the brains, I love him. and then there's I love the. Him, uh, and I've seen him in the, a lot of other things. I know that actor. I've seen him in a lot of things. I love him. I've only caught little bits of those shows. You know, he first got his uh, his start in that. Uh, what was it? Pushing Daisies. Yes, that's yeah, right. That was that's the first right. thing. And very different character too. Very. Intense. I like the chick who's the super programmer too. Yeah. yeah. And now that we're past that tangent, welcome to another week of Crash Chords. Um, sorry we left you for a week, but we're back. And we brought a special guest, her first time on the podcast, the living statue Galatea, who I've been wanting to get on the show for a while, and I'm glad she's here. Huzzah! I am. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she brought us her album, which we'll get into soon, um, but actually, Steve wanted to say a little bit, before we get into this week's stuff, you were at, um, what was it, a career fair a few yeah, weeks ago? Yeah, it was ago? a career fair where I actually talked about what we do here at the podcast, and it was a it was sort of a mixed-up thing. This is already a little bit removed now, but this I sort of want to send out a thank you to everyone involved. I want to thank uh, everyone at the Point CDC, where I participated uh, the Thursday before last at the first annual career fair, and I had some great discussions with my fellow panelists, uh, DJ Pusha and Quinye Sturdivant, a uh, backup singer on entrepreneurship and making it in the arts. So we had plenty of insightful questions uh, from the students, and I hope we did our best to answer them, perhaps inspire some people to get over that first hump with getting in the arts, which is also the hard, always the hardest. And specifically, I want to thank Brianna Fullwood, the coordinator, and all the facilitators there for helping guide the discussion, especially my good friend Angie Martinez for recommending me and introducing us to all the staff at The Point. It's a great place. From what I've seen, probably the best one of the best examples of extracurricular study and urban renewal, college prep, all that stuff. It, sound, it sounds like a wonderful program. I'm glad that we were able to be a part of it. I mean, I wish we could have all been there, but hopefully next time if they do another, we can get more than a week's notice and then we can all be there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's the way but, this stuff works. <laughs> but I'm glad that you were able to represent us and I'm glad that it went really well. Um, I was psyched that we'd be able to talk about something like this. I mean, mm -hmm. we are not... We are definitely not the pioneers of podcasting. You know, it's been around for a while, but I'm glad that we are a part of it and that we were able to share our part of the pie with those kids. Mm -hmm. um, oh, uh, there was something else I wanted to ask you, and of course now I've forgotten. Oh, you went to see Cirque du Soleil recently. Yeah, that's something else on my list here. Uh, yeah, I haven't week. actually seen it in like six years. I used to go a lot, actually, the earlier ones, but I don't remember the names, the specific name, the subtitles of a lot of them. But. I always wanted to go see it, and yet it also wasn't that thing that was like on the top of my list, only because I knew so little about it, right. and because I didn't know anyone else who might be interested in also such a thing. Also because it's like obscene amounts of dollars. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, well, tickets are expensive. In any case, it's kind of related to uh, this whole the point .CDC thing, because apparently they had, uh, they had tickets through their institution, where they were able to get Free tickets, pretty much for all of the uh, for all of the staff and facilitators there. So right. they were all able to bring like plus ones. So I ended up going with my friend Angie, and it was uh, it was, it was great. It really was. We got to go backstage. We got to see all the all the masks, all the artwork. Okay. That's cool. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's really, really awesome. cool. It was pretty phenomenal. What was the name of? Do you remember the specific name of this this show? Um, so all of them have a subtitle. Yes, it did have a subtitle. It started with a V. It is on the tip of my tongue, but alas, I do not have the ticket in front of me. Well, in you'll put case, it in the show notes later. You will do. And uh, I saw it at the Barclays Center too, which is what my, was my first experience with the Barclays Center since we got to watch it getting built pretty much in the past two and a half years. And uh, it's a pretty impressive venue, kind oh, of a cool. mini MSG. Yeah, I've heard. I've heard that they've fine-tuned the kinks. The, in the early days when the venue first opened, they were having a lot of sound issues. A friend of mine went to see Rush, and they said it was terrible. Ah. So. Yeah, well, acoustics are gonna, but they're bound to fluctuate from venue to venue, and there's always gonna be one group based on their particular, uh, their particular niche of music that's gonna complain, because everybody has different acoustical requirements. Yeah. One other thing I want to talk about before we get into, uh, Galatea, who's our guest, and the album, 
Last week, we saw the launch of the second podcast on Crash Chords, um, Crash Chords Autographs, a name that John gave me that I actually really liked. It's a one-on-one review show. I started mostly doing over the phone. If I can get artists from all over in person, I'll do it that way too. But for now, it's a phone interview one-on-one, an intimate chat with artists that we have not had on the show. Although several of them, uh, after the interview, have said they can't wait to come on the proper show, which is nice. Um, We debuted it with... Mark Young, who is on this podcast, is a, fe- a special feature. You mean Mark? Uh, or Mark, as his band name <laughs> is. And um, his it's tour... actually a W there. Yeah. It's not just a, a Sonic thing. And his tour mate, Spider-1, Power, uh, Power Man 5000, the little brother of Rob Zombie. Um, we put the episodes together because they were both on the shorter side. Typically, they'll be around an hour. But it was a great chat with both musicians. Um, we also got to feature... As the new theme song for the podcast, Yo! Into New York by Malibu Shark Attack featuring Jesse Dangerously, which I'm thankful for from Tribe One, who is a member of the band, gave us the okay to use it, and is actually the second guest on that show next week. Um, But I'm really excited to do this. It'll be another avenue to get the word out about our show on our website and get people excited and interested in the the podcast prime, as I've started calling it. Podcast prime. I like that. Um... But enough about us and enough about what we've done. We have Galatea, the living statue here, um, who has recently also made her burlesque debut, which I was very excited to get to see personally. Um, before we get into the album, what made you want to transition from just statue work to burlesque? Uh, hmm. It's not like it was a decision. It was more like a fluke. It was a progression thing, and I got to the point with my statuing at enough shows, and people are like, when are you going to do burlesque? When are you going to do burlesque? Um, and it just kind of fell into my lap, sort of, because it's something that I've been talking on and off about for several years. Um, and then there was an opening in a show, and the producer offered me a slot. I was like, do you want to do this? Are you ready? And I said, sure. And then proceeded to panic and spend the next four months panicking, and then I did it, and it was great. So... <laughs> cool. Well, I mean, I personally enjoyed the performance. I thought it was very well thought out, and the comic timing was... Oh, it was stupid. Don't well, lie. Well, it, it was, was dumb, but stupid. in most glorious of ways. <laughs> um, so you brought us Future Islands by... Uh, I'm sorry. The band is Future Islands. Mm-hmm. The album is called Singles. Yes. Um, what made you choose this record? Um, so up until about... Ooh, I guess it was a month and a half ago now. Um, I was nannying a kid um, who I... They were up in Queens, and then they moved down to uh, about my neighborhood. And his father... Um, works as a writer at um billboard and so he's really into music and so he bought this on vinyl and he took brought it home and he told his son like oh you can listen to this on your portable record player and so he's like this is my music and we listened to it a lot and i really 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 liked it um and i thought it was different than my usual fare because i don't really listen to new music anymore um and i miss him and i thought he would think this was cool when he's old enough to listen to grown-ups talking about music Um, because he's a super little hipster when it comes to music he's like five and he knows so much stuff about things and this is like his favorite they're starting him young now yeah oh he 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 did the you don't know what band oh pulled that on me and i was like who who did the The boy yeah he totally did i don't remember i don't remember it was something his dad listens to with him and he's like, yeah, blah, blah, this band. And I was like, who's that? He's like, I can't believe you don't know that band. And I was like, oh, my God. He's either going to terrify the elementary school crowd or he's going to. Oh, he's super cool. Yeah. All the, all the adults love the... him because he listens to a song on the radio once and he knows it. The eligible bachelor. Oh, totally. <laughs> he's super charismatic, too. Like, everyone adores him. So this will serve him well. Hmm. Very cool. It's definitely one of the more personal album choices we've had, since it has a direct connection to something from your day job. Indeed. So we start with the title? Yes. So this, the title of the album is called Singles. The first track is titled Seasons, parentheses, Waiting on You. Um, which, I mean, the first thing we get hit with the minute the album starts is In Your Face, Synth. Oh, for sure. Heavy, heavy synth. Um, pretty much a your cliché thought of 80s pop synth, but more to it than that. Blatantly cheesy 80s synth. I mean, not cheesy. cheesy. I mean, not cheesy. No, I'm, I'm throwing cheesy. the word out. I'm throwing the word, but here's the thing. I frequently noted this in the podcast. I, that really doesn't phase me. It doesn't phase me, at least in the same way it phases other people. When they hear cheesy 80s synth, they're immediately deterred. But, I don't know. Not me. It's I think it familiar. has a nostalgic air to, to I think it. From, it's familiar. I think familiar it's is nostalgic. better than cheesy. It's accessible. Because it is very much uh, of the pop of the no, era. Cheesy is erasure. Erasure is cheesy. Yeah. 
This is I not cheesy so much cheesy. as of of an era, and it's nostalgic. I wouldn't say it's cheesy. It's cheesy is like hokey, like diddly deep, and it's not. There's some moments later in this album that get pretty hokey. I'll admit, perhaps not, not this, not no, this not first here. song. This but is that I'm just saying in the fact that you know that there was a time. It's not today, but there was a time way back when when it when the sound itself was done to death, and that's why people kind of you know. Tell me more, Grandpa, about what it was like when you were younger. Sorry. Hold I on am not that. the oldest one here. I want that to be known, <laughs> <laughs> sir. All right. All right. Yes, but you act the oldest here. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> but but what it does is actually it, it creates a... It's a very distinct s- melancholy from the 80s. Melancholy. This, I like that. I was going to say sad, but I like <laughs> melancholy better. It's a very uh, distinct melancholy I thought it was feeling. melancholy you could smell as melancholy. Yeah, let's wax it on. Let's, let's really, like, rub that in. <laughs> um... No, I agree, though. it's Even though it's familiar, it's not familiar in a way that's boring. I think it's familiar in a way that's nostalgic. And and it, it lends to the singer's voice, which is also a very familiar and comforting voice. I like his inflection, the way he sings, the way he carries himself. There's an emotiveness to it that's very feels very personal and very connective. Well, that's the second thing I noted. And, and, and for sure, I am going to agree with John. It definitely... It went, the connotations that the synth has does bring it back to that sort of... I would, I would call it an eerie sadness a little bit, much like you would get, I suppose, from a faded photograph, because as, uplifti- as uplifting as the tones may be sometimes, it's just sometimes a little hard for me to separate the sound from what should be the time frame. So does it disturb you? Because if it's eerie, then it's slightly creepy. You find it creepy? A little bit. Just a little bit. In the, in the, the same hollow. way you would you would watch, like, like found footage or something like that, and you're like, this is such a bygone time, a bygone snapshot. Does bygone scare you, though? Because I wouldn't say it's... I mean, maybe to you, I don't... I would not find old photos creepy or... It eerie. reminds you of the passage of time. Very closely. The time that people are getting older, people are getting close to death. So, yes, there's a little bit of that implied. Just a bit. It's it's the, just the... The synth is very much that earlier hollow noise. The earlier hollow sound that we got from the first level, second level... Uh, not level, generation... Uh, synthesizers. Yeah. A lot different than what we can get nowadays and what most people would use nowadays. Uh, because of that hollow, I definitely see you could call it creepy, but I didn't feel any creep here. Yeah, me neither. Definitely not. It just felt depressing. It was, especially when, no, it, <laughs> it's, it's something I said. It's, it's almost like a, it's like a hint of foreshadowing, to be honest. I can definitely be, uh, definitely be on board with that. Because the tones are so, they're so sort of harsh. They're, it almost seems like they're deprived of humanity at times. But that is made up for in droves by the singer. And that's what I really, what you started to move on to, and I really want to get to, Matt. That, that was the, the second thing that came. Because after, like, you know, about eight bars, I'm used to the synth at this point. And then the vocalist steps in, which I immediately found myself mesmerized by. First regarding the register in which he sings, kind of sounds almost like a low-register female a little bit. Of course, we know it's not. We know it's male. But it's because of that that breathiness that he includes with his singing almost gives it that edge. Like he's somewhere between ranges. And yet it's very, it's very contained. It's very... He doesn't go too high or too low. It's a comfortable range. But there's something in the breathiness, the graveliness, and even the smokiness in his voice that's really satisfying, kind of like a fine cigar, but it also comes across, like I said, as feeling constrained. This is the lead singer, uh, Samuel Herring, who we're speaking of. Uh, um, He's the vocalist for the band, and I believe he also writes all of the lyrics, which isn't always the case, Um, but in this case it is. And you get a very personal sense from the way he delivers it, um, as well as the way... uh, the inflection he uses I'm starting the sentence over the inflection he uses really kind of sells what he's going through what he's feeling from the moment he opens his mouth yeah, it's... it actually harkens back to our discussion just at the end of, of, of last episode uh, where we talked about unconventional vocalists or, or at least ones that aren't what you'd say classically talented but derive most of their excess, success from, from inflection yeah I mean, he's definitely one of those singers I can see. He he definitely has classical training for sure, but his voice is very unique in the way he delivers and the way he emotes. And that's what really connected me to it. Like when we've talked about Blue October, I really connect with an emotional singer who has an inflection that I can relate to. And he is definitely a singer like that. He has something of an otherworldly quality in his voice. <laughs> no, I'm, no, I agree. I'm not... I agree. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's just I thought fun. I was going to have to make that argument. No. It's, it's just a funny it's way a of presenting bit, it's it. It's a little How bit out there. That? 
it's also coupled to his his lyrical work. It's very imagery driven. Yes, and uh, it's the choice of phrasing is definitely a little more unique than what I'm I I would expect uh, expect from like synth pop or pop or anything of an indie genre because it's it seems like classical poetry. And I'm not saying that indie doesn't do that sort of classical kind of a feel to it, but it it seems to be a lot more careful. I think is the word I want to use. He's very 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 specific in his word choicing. He's very succinct. Even, it's like even participles, even the choice of using just certain parts of speech. He knows when to drop something off, when to just use an adjective and no noun. Like parts like that are just very, very difficult to do. Well, I'm going to use that as a jumping off point for melody, because this is what I started to say about how he feels constrained. Uh, and actually, Galatea, we were having an interesting discussion right before the podcast on this as to sort of arguing whether he feels constrained as in, you know, range-wise, or whether it's more of just the force that he uses behind each note. And, uh, I mean, I guess it could be argued, to be honest, but... I, I found that he, he at least feels limited in what he can do. Like, phrases that reach outward as if to sort of hold a note for good duration, they tend to just kind of peter out. It's almost as if he's he's singing in staccato, these very short notes because the breath just isn't there. And yet, he really does push sort of to the edge of that range. And that's the other thing I was talking about. Range-wise, he, um, he feels kind of comfortable Phrases that reach upward don't always go for the gold medal. Instead, he's just in a range that I could find myself sort of joining in. And I did, frequently, in most of these tracks. Even though I can't quite do the same breathiness that he has, but I had that going at least. It they're, pairs, they're memorable. Yeah, and it, it pairs well with the underlying bass in the whole song. Uh, very steady, but uh, has a little bit of flourishing here and there. And this is, becomes uh, the theme work of a lot of the music is being backed up by very strong but simple bass work. And I think it pairs beautifully with how he's singing. His level of inflection, the lower gravelly uh, realm he's found himself in, works great with what the bass does to back him up. It also works well uh, theme-wise. And uh, I want to go back and say that the that constraint that I was talking about that's not something that I find as a negative. I think it comes it, it comes across as fulfilling a very powerful emotion, which uh, kind of brings me directly to the lyrics. Um, obviously, I'm talking about a track here that's about seasons change. It's so, you know, some of the implications that I got in the very beginning, I think, are still there in the lyrics here. It's about the passage of time. You find the lines like, people change. You know, but some people never do. You know when people change, they gain a piece, but they lose one too. So it's it's... It's it's an observational track, and obviously, when I said initially, going back to the title, since we're talking about singles, we we are getting the sense that this is some sort of uh, um, referred love. Interestingly, when he says a piece um, on their official website, it's not spelled as in I have a piece of a thing, not I break into pieces. It's they have a piece as in the opposite of war. Yeah, no, that's what P -E -A -C -S, I got. P e a c s, which is interesting. So they they have a pe they gain a sense of peace. Yeah. Oh, okay. And they lose. Well, they trade one form of peace for another, which I just noticed now. I was like, oh, people shatter. But no, it's. They find a peace. They find which, peace or solace peace. in something, but then sacrifice but that, it in other areas. It's in, yeah. That's what I'm talking about, his word choice. Yeah. They gain a peace, but they lose one too. Now, he's got a very interesting metaphorical sense that I don't think we, we often come across, or often we come across very. Uh, cliched metaphors, the kind of things that, you know, can really be hammered home. And I'm not saying that's absent in these lyrics, but I think that when it's chosen, it's very it's very on point because of the fact that he's speaking from a, a broken position, so it's not unlike him to sort of go for the, the cliched, for, cliched metaphors in certain areas. Cliched metaphors? Yeah, cliched you always said cliched like metaphors. That. Doing a lot of little uh, word combos. Word, I like that a lot. Yeah. Word fusions, <laughs> if you will. Um, yeah, and I mean, it really... The, the lyrical content, when delivered with the, the breathy staccato you were mentioning, really kind of hammers home this kind of uncertainty and this this fleetingness that the seasons have, this change that these metaphors are trying to support. Definitely. And we're going to get into uh, uh, lyrical content even further in supporting that. But I do want to go back to music quickly, because I want to talk about the development of this track. Uh, Music-wise, the verse, it really had me. I mean, I wanted to live in that verse for a while. 
because of the whole bygone 80s romance thing. It's something that's just really moving to me in that nostalgic way. And it carried that same tone and that structure right into, I would want to say maybe the pre-chorus, uh, because it still has the same, like I said, same structure, same general uh, groove to it, but it's when you start hammering home that, because I've been waiting on you, I've been waiting on you. So I, I kind of want to say this is either the pre-chorus or the chorus, but it's not the heavier moment of the song. That really happens later. It could either be called the chorus or the bridge. It might just be a departure. But it is heavier. It's it's a little bit more centered, and it breaks out. You have a, a sort of a heavier, g- distorted guitar sound that enters. It sounds a little bit electronic, but also a little bit more modern than the 80s stuff that we've had up to this point. I kind of associate it with the guitar that was used in, in, in TV on the radio's uh, first album, um, or even their first works, the, their first EP, Young Liars, and also... Their first album, Desperate Youth, Bloodthirsty Babes. It's it's the kind of synth work that was uh, really championed by their um, their main writer, David Siddick. And he was like, the synthesizer is what drove that entire album. So this is like the same kind of stuff that I see, and that's about ten years prior, and it seems to be following in those footsteps a little bit. Sort of a hmm, in alt style that borrows from 80s pop. And that's where it was going here, which which kind of pulled me from from the pure nostalgia that I had in the first verse, yeah. well, which I think was a very positive thing. It did keep it from becoming something that would have come out during the 80s. It, well, yeah, it, 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 it definitely feels unique to now, still. Like, and it, 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 didn't pulls change, from other it didn't change the aura of the song, either. It kind of just sort of superimposed a different... Well, I, it kind of idea got a, on uh, top of it. it. It superimposed a better, a, 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 a different idea than what you would expect it from the 80s. Kind of like a dark alleyway feel, actually. It has it. It has a, a modern Where are you flair. That? Yeah, well, I, I dark got... alleyways are scary and damp and cold. Apparently, and I'm getting a much a much scarier uh, vibe no, from this track I than you not... guys. You you find it creepy, you find it cheesy, and you think it's a slippery alley filled with garbage. And I'm getting a warm room. It's probably got wood paneling, plush couches. Stuff's a little faded. <laughs> It's a nice, take, chilly afternoon. Take, and yet I get all of this room. in positive ways. That's a funny thing. I would take that warm room and I would have it have empty walls, a broken thermostat. I would take it. It would be devoid of a lot of the warmth that you would, oh, see, would consider See, I find this home. really warm and comforting and very, like, fuzzy, like, nice sepia tone stuff. Yeah, I'm but more... The whole, but it's the whole idea. In the lyrics, it's, it talks about how summer is here, but winter's bite has not left. No, it's talking about the winter's going to wash away the taste of summer. And That's, the winter is going to wish it had summer. But it's still that duality that, that even... That's it's, just the it's, sense of longing that I think disturbs me fundamentally. It's, I don't know, it's I injecting see. that coldness into it. Yeah, but the it. music... It's keeping it from being... But that's a, a happy song. But that's purely in the lyrics because the music lends more towards a warmer feeling. He's he's not he's not cold and bitter. Like he's just kind of being a little like yeah melancholy. It's, it's like he's a, a cold little air sad, air but it's a it's a, it's a it's a con, it's a contemplative sad. He's not. Well, I'm depressed. not going creep like Steve is. I don't no, believe it's creep. It's like just Steve. sort of like perhaps creep is a harsh word, but I am I'm going to argue that it's sort of a, the warmth that, that you see for me is just a filter. And I, I feel like I, I, I see a lot of longing behind that, and that's fulfilled in the way he sings, that gravelliness of his voice, and also the lyrical content here, just pushing with... I mean, that's not that's not a necessarily a warm thing for me. As it breaks, the summer will wake, but the winter will wash away what is left of the taste. I mean... I, but then it, it furthers this, this experience. As it breaks, the summer will warm, but the winter will crave what is gone. That's... It, it's 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 ominous. It's hope- no, it's no ominous. Just, ominous. No, it's 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 ominous implies, implies future. Yeah. This is all stuck in the past, and there's something that's disturbing to me about living in the past that yeah. makes this this track See, just I'm a little bit. See, I'm not afraid of being wistful. Wistful is just a thing to be. Sometimes it's not a bad or a good or a scary. It's but just it's, a, it, it's just an is. It I follow feel, you. Yeah. In my experience, wistful has often accompanied very uh, other other traits that aren't as, as oh, well. Sometimes like I just have very wistful or... afternoons that are just me being wistful for no apparent reason. Oh, sure. But it's also a way to kind of get into your head. And I guess I'm kind of on that wary stage yeah. as I, of this I first track there. I guess it's just more connected to your personal... Your emotive state you're, based on this situation. You're projecting onto it, I yeah. think. 
I'm, but I but see I'm considering gonna... ly- at lyrical content here in this track and also later in the album, I don't think I'm just projecting. I think that's kind of the way this album is headed at well, the moment. Well, the vibe that you're deliberately deciding it is that's disturbing you and stuff. That's how it makes you feel. Yeah. Whereas I don't find this disturbing. I find this sort of just a slow afternoon of sad contemplation and sort of longing for things that aren't anymore. And that's and it's not. It's a little sad, but it's more just like and this is how it goes. But fair enough. I, I see that the same way. I do see it the same way, but I'm not seeing the warmth. <laughs> I'm not seeing the Oh, warmth. I get warm when I'm wistful. It's sort I of a comfortable that's... feeling. It depends you know, if you're looking it's back like crunchy to leaves positive and jeans things, in a, in a hoodie. It's just a comfortable thing that happens sometimes. It's not... It doesn't... It's just not a chilly thing to me. I don't... Yeah, but... Well, lyrically, it, it doesn't seem it's... like he's looking back at warm moments, and that's the thing. It seems like there's, there's a lot of uh, unfinished business... No, I'm just saying it's a wistful thing to me, but that's yeah. how I see it. Okay. So. Well, I think moving on to the next track here, because I am going to pull away from this. It's not as if this this continued throughout. The next track, in fact, is the most uplifting track for me musically. I mean, it keeps that same '80s vibe going, and yet it's no longer, you know, what I see as sort of the somewhat sad, reflective '80s pop, but instead more of the '80s club music. Uh, you even referenced house. Which I think I kind of see that, based on the second track here, which is called Spirit. Spirit, indeed. <laughs> um, no, yeah, I mean it starts off with a, a good solid groove that really pulls you into that kind of ha- '80s house kind of feeling. I, I think was a great way to describe it. Um, it was the- airy. It was bouncy. I, I don't know. What's- I said it was boppy. It's just this sort of like. Oh yeah, yeah. Do, 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 do. Like you feel really like okay, we're gonna do a thing. It's like a video game, like an old school like. We're gonna go. We're gonna but think. it was even though it's in minor, but yet the whole thing, it's texture wise, it's so cheerful. Texture wise, it's, it's cheerful. Yeah, it's yeah. bouncy in a chipper way. I but, mean, it it's still got that. Like I said, I'm still gonna argue it's the dated electronica that we actually had back in uh, Boards of Canada, Tomorrow's Harvest, which was back in episode 54. And we get about eight bars of that. And right after these, the, just this little exploration of, of of texture, it got really, really fun. It made me wish to God it was 1984, and I was ready for some clubbing. <laughs> and it takes me a lot to say that actively, because I don't believe I you were born know. at that time anyway. No, it would, he wasn't. It would be quite hard for you. He to wasn't party. born until a year later. We were two. No, I oh. was two. You were. you were the only one who was alive then, Matt. Yeah. Thank I you. remember it well. <laughs> yeah, the cl- yeah. Hitting the clubs at two years old. You weren't Those two. Those were the days. I was one. If we're talking You had your low ride and cradle like me. My sunglasses. You drop wheels. Your meth is all over the place. <laughs> this. Meth is not my words. The, the boppy, airy lightness, the happiness that this song was doing, it wasn't completely shown in his vocals, though. What and do you mean? for that, I was grateful. He still had a very down to earth. Well, he's he's feature. not singing like a pop star. He's oh, okay, like, yeah. He's, he's gotcha. like he's singing. He's smoothing out the bop, sort of. And Actually, he did a great job by putting. She said, "Making invisible hand gestures." No, I, I, <laughs> well, I they're very visible to us, just not the audience. I think, but we've now told them. We'll, we'll, we'll take pictures. Um, <laughs> oh, but the the bounce. Gallery photos, thank you. That that airy, happy go lucky bounce was mitigated. By his use of um, emphasis on those bounces. And I loved how he did that. That was one of the my favorite features of this song. Just the way he was emphasizing his voice as the song progresses. It wasn't on every beat or every other beat. It was every maybe three or four beats. It wasn't on every, every phrase either. And there was something was, very unique about the first phrase in that regard where he actually came across as sounding very robotic. And that was just the first phrase that he starts singing in. Well, and also those first couple of lines, it's just word, comma, word, comma, word, Trusted, comma. repeated, candor, uneven. And then it starts going into more of a, uh, more of a sing-songy type thing. <laughs> in, and it's the will to find the right design. The form belongs to no one holding truth. So, yeah, I think it's starting off a little bit vague. But there's something about, uh, just tonally, there's something that I really, really liked about him kind of sounding robotic against, against the warmth of the bass here. And yes, I'm using the word, word warm now, but it's specifically in regards to the bass. I love the crispness of this bass. I'm winning you over. <laughs> <laughs> that I said you had me in this track. <laughs> that, that synth, though, still kept it from being just full warm. It was hotter. It was energized. Mm-hmm. It wasn't yeah. just comfortable. Well, this, this because there was a lot of energy involved with it, and it was... I found was, contrast. I think maybe that's what you're honing in on, but I found contrast between the sort of the electronic texture and the acoustic texture. Yes. I mean, otherwise, you're immersed in this clearly 
kind of a fake environment, all these electronic goings on. But then there's the bass and the drums, which are plain as day, unsynthesized, and more of the driving soul of this music. The drums keep it moving, and the bass, like I said, it's crisp, it's animated. I realize I'm stretching the term acoustic over to the bass, which is clearly electric, but you know I'm referring to like the human element behind the instrument, as opposed to synth, where the human element is always masked. So it's kind of like this living, breathing foundation with a manufactured superstructure, if that makes sense. Sort of, in your very elaborate way. Well, um, I mean, but, but I understand what you're it's saying. It's like a reverse Terminator. <laughs> That makes perfect sense. Oh, I'll that's take exactly it. it. Next yes. song. <laughs> yeah, that was that was the Sing. perfect way. Okay. And she, anyway, no, I got more. As, as the song progresses, Too bad. Though, as the song progresses, it's it's progressives progresses. I'm saying things. Stop Her interrupting feelings. me. Um, it, it's it's humanized. Look, look, He's excused. It's humanized. Everything is brought together by his voice. That is the factor that actually brings all the musical elements together. It is a really tying uh, mechanic, I think, in a lot of the songs, if not all of them. That was my big question, as I was asking myself at this point, where does he fit in? Because at times, like that first verse, he sounds robotic, and then other times, later in this song especially, he sounds very passionate. Well, he's the grounding element, right? Because he's using so much celestial and like spiritual supernatural imagery. He's this earthy, grounded thing. And he's yeah. surrounded by things that are non-human, right? So he's got this like synthy exterior of like artificiality right and so he's the human form there and then he's this the base on touching the earth talking about these big things also flying around him because he's got like winged eyes and spirits diving and you've got very... the driving earthy base right and then you have the the, the flutily things around <laughs> and it's 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 lyrically uh... and musically it is it's celestial a... that's for sure yeah i would say fey Yes, yes. Fate. Fate would be the word. Fate yeah. is the is, is might be the word of the day for a lot of what he does, and that's it's that go. infusion. Yeah. I wish I had looked at the whole album through that lens, but yeah, yeah. Good it's, word. that's not bad. It's those spirits infusing him that transform him over the course of the song. Mm -hmm. That's why he starts to match up with the music. That's why he starts playing off of it, not just off the bass like in the first track, but with the rest of the synth work and trying to match up his vocals to what is going on with these otherworldly creatures. Yeah, actually I noticed this specifically in the way that he, he sort of tapers off some of those phrases. Like, just in, in the melodies themselves, it's like he just lost the breath to continue, so then he kind of stutters them out until his lungs are completely emptied. Like, the situation just pulled all the air out of him. He and can't keep up with the dance of what's going on around him. That's exactly what it but is. he's trying, and I think the fact that he tries... Yeah, the fact that he tries is, is, is the... The, the shining beacon of this track right here. Which is what marries the whole song together. And That's... makes him sound more passionate, because if you have a person who's trying in, in, in action, then obviously it's passion. I mean, that's, that's attempt. Don't like say to see don't, attempt. Don't. We're don't. so in the zone right now. Uh, it's adorable. Yeah, I know. It's because the different seating area. We get to look at each other for once. <laughs> I'm in a different corner this time. Got we're, we're recording <laughs> from the plush like. and locale of, stu of the of the lush Studio 2J. It's the last moon of Poosh is what it is. The last, mo the last, last moon of Poosh. Last moon of Poosh. Is, this is Poosh. Um, I think this is a good point to, t to jump into the third track on the record, Sun in the Morning. Oh, by the way. Since it, I do it briefly, just so that we can like mm -hmm. segue. Segue. Mm -hmm. um, this whole album is probably about a woman, right? As an overarching, like it's he's talking about a particular woman, which I think I can say as we work into this next song, like just in spirit, he's talking about the sun and the moon. Yeah. Then he jumps into the next song, and now she is. The, he's saying, find it, find the sun, find these things, be all these big hoopy stuff. And then you jump into the next song, and now she is the thing he was wanting to find. Was I always oh. got as I had gotten from the from the lyrics in the first track? Like I said, yeah. that's something that mm -hmm. that longing thing. I think yeah. is something right. that I, I see just, her I in the past at now, this moment. Because he in, yeah. the, in Sun in the Morning he talks about how she's his sun, his star, the evening, his moon. But in the previous song he's saying he wants Go to find, find these things, sun. force the moon, loose the earth, share the light inside of you, and now well, we just like to the next song. But the, like, it's the same thing with, where seasons had the winter. Imagery he's it so goes into spirit. Weaving these songs together, he's singing yes. them along. Yeah. He uses a lot of the he same exact one nouns and words. It's 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 like an essay, and each one of these is a paragraph in a sense, but they're unique. And I don't know. He's stringing. He's threading them nicely. There's yes, little, there's a through line for all the that's songs. That's what I'm trying to say. Yes. Wording, blar, <laughs> stuff. And so, sun in the morning 
Yeah, it's, this song conveys this idea of... Uh, well, first of all, let's start with the music. As it starts, you kind of get this dreamy feel to the song immediately. It's, I like would a, it's say, as if the reverb was turned to the max in this track. I mean, no, I know we came from something that is celestial, which probably also had its 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 uh, its flair of reverb, but it certainly wasn't there in the individual like like beeps and boops of the of the sound work. This is much more broad. This is kind of, almost got that empty warehouse feel. So to be honest, I, I'm I'm throwing it back to the creepy here, but. Again, perhaps it's the but wrong no, word. no, no. This is an actual. This is more upbeat than spirit. Yeah. yeah. This oh, is more, spirit. No way. It's yes. more like standing in an empty warehouse and there's all those sunbeams coming through the windows. Yeah. All, right, this, all right, that I buy. This that was buy. more. It, it wasn't more energetic, but it was significantly happier. His chorus is so bright. Even like, with his raspy gravel that he's gargling on as he's singing this, it is so happy. For a, it seems like an extremely depressing person. It's like the most manic a depressive person well, can be. Here's the thing that I'm picking up on that also kind of pushes or maybe it he away just has a little a bit. a wide range of emotions. One one of those things, <laughs> just melodically, is that he always has a line and then a pause. Sometimes a really long pause. When you consider these verses, he'll say something like, "Mine all mine, wander, away we go." These are all very separated, and that I think. I think those pauses, it's almost like he needs time to contemplate. And that's something that also kind of unsettles me in a way. Or at least it, 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 brings it, it wraps it back around to the introspective here. I feel like he's back in that stage. I, I mean, this, I, I, this, is, this is him discovering the words to express this new feeling. He has f- found something new for him and does not yet understand it. I don't know. This is something he seems to know pretty clearly. He knows exactly. As what as he's a song about. progresses, but in the beginning, with that halting nature, it's I, I it's I think the he's, newness. Oh, I don't know if it's new. It's more like he's trying to figure out what words he wants to use to describe this thing that's incredibly yeah. intimate and familiar to him. But it's something he's never had to express before, well, verbally it'd be like at least. Trying to describe what is home. You yes. know what it is innately. It's it's part of your brain. There's no then, way to to put it into and words. And he's stumbling, and then he know, he starts to figure out like, what do I want to say? What is this person? Well, I so have this little I theory. Know. Well, he's not. It's not a new thing. It's the finding the words is maybe the new thing. Yeah, yeah. That's that's that's. He, I, I'm, I'm personally ready to stop being cagey here. I kind of want to come out with my theory for this track, and that's the fact that this is a very literal thing. I realize that the she it, it implies that it's a woman, but I believe this is actually the son. In that the he's, morning, that he's that he's um he's just calling the sun attributing. a she. Yeah, he's, but, but I believe it's, I believe it's in reference. Like when you consider the previous two tracks, there is there's sort of a, a a response to the fact that that women come and go, and that he can't always trust a woman to stay in his life. So at least he can trust the sun. She but, loves to watch me go. She hates to watch me go. But I have to watch her go. I love to watch her go. Then what do you do with the fact that the sun in the morning is also the star of the evening and the moon as well? I mean, I believe those, those are, are three the, different those are, celestial bodies. But those are three different things that are always constant. And it, 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 it's you could go much deeper than that. Here, the light of your life, the guiding lights, the imagery of bringing light to your life is very much present in this. The sun, the moon, the stars. These are all she things. She is all of these things. She is the him. light to his life. Right, that's... I f- but it can be, t- from Steve's point of view, no, it could be true. taken as fantastical, I, I, as is he's latching onto something that he can depend on. Well, I personally think that it... I mean, the way it's written, honestly, it's not that it can be. It is both. It can be both. The The song is written in a framework in a way that you can really interpret it either way. Oh, I'm not going to get one metaphor for this album. It's just yeah. impossible. There's just I think so there's a, much let's levels... Let's say there's so this. much layering here. Yeah. If I were to, if I were assume that, that I'm just imagining this whole thing and that she is really the person in his life, then this is pure fantasy then. Because, obviously, he's kind of proven at this point in the previous two tracks that this is not something that is, is as real and permanent as he makes it out to be. It's 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 as wispy as time itself. Or maybe she is what is steady. She is always who she is. But he's not. He may not be, or he may not be able to keep that thing. Yeah. Well, there's well, no he... reference of what he... So I, I don't know. I think it's a early to make that judgment, in this track at least, only because there's very little references to the way he is reacting in the situation. It's all about her. So... That's a theory, and I'm not. I'm not. I'm not uh, putting it down yet. It's just I, there is uh, there is something. For that. Yeah, there is a, a theme that could be built around this that we'll talk about in a little bit because I need some and, more. And I'm not. Maybe we need to get back to the music well, here I'm, also. Yeah, also, there's that. I'm also clearly yeah, not saying, Steve, that you're wrong or that you made that <coughs> up. I mean, there's enough. 
there's enough vagueness in a lot of his lyric writing to interpret as you will. And while there, he ha- whether he had a specific thing or mind in mind or not, it doesn't matter. What matters is how you relate to it and what you take from it. Of course. It. We're just, putting out, we're just right, right, trying right. to piece together the album as most, most people do. So uh, when you go back to the music here, I mean, obviously that's one way you could take this. You could not look at the lyrics at all. You could just not bother with the story and just take it face value for the tones that wash over you and so forth. Um, and I gotta go back to that to that melody again, the line and the pause. It makes this a little bit of a slower, more trudging track to me. Even if you guys get a get a, a warmer vibe, there was something to me there that was. I felt like it was kind of cheating itself as it went, and I think that's why I had to go over to the theme because it suddenly made a little bit more sense when I factored in the theme. This when, wasn't. It, it. I did not feel it to be. A detriment at this point. This, I think, is a better point to bring up in uh, another couple of songs that are coming up, because I didn't feel it so repetitive or trudging or drawn out. No, if I, I had felt one breathing later, here. I mean, this this goes back and forth based on, um, from track to track. But if I had one critique at this point, it would definitely be lack of development. I think the idea in this track just wasn't as gripping as the previous two tracks to survive a hundred percent on pop structure, musically or lyrically. Musically. Okay. Well, maybe Musically. he is right that it is breathing, right? She loves to watch me go. She hates to watch me go. So you have this waves going back and forth, right? I hate to watch her go. I love to watch her go. I know she's always coming home. She knows I'm always coming home. It's just sitting here. Ebb and flow. Ebb and flow. Just sort of sitting in this moment of, like, it's a, it's a Think, oh, no, him just I, sitting. I agree. Song, you know? That's But see, I had to go over th- to theme for that. Oh, yeah. Right? Like You're that, saying that, that musically me, you didn't get musically, that. Musically, that to me wouldn't survive without the, the gotcha. theme itself. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's a, that, that um, makes sense. You could say, I guess, his halting was, was, was interesting from an artistic standpoint, but I'm waiting for him to use that voice in the same capacity as, as the first two tracks. Well, I think. the whole song ended up being about waiting. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's that's what he has to do. So feeling, uh, this feeling of... Not waiting. on theme. I'm not on theme. <laughs> I'm just talking about, like, you know, belting it, like, in the same way. Well, that's, that why, that's why the music is doing what it's doing. That's why his vocals are doing what they're the doing. The right. Interesting from an artistic standpoint. But I felt that in the music and the vocals without the lyrics, because this is one of those songs that it's actually kind of hard to hear a lot of what he's saying. I, I know, but I'm saying that it, it supports, the music supports the art. He's saying that the music on its own wouldn't carry the same same thing. The music itself is what Steve is saying. He's saying that it supports yeah. the overall art, and it makes the song as a whole convey that. Were it not for, exactly were it not for the lyrical content, I would wonder why you know there's those long drawn out pauses. The I would say like, well, the you, melody might have been a little bit weak, but artist art supports you, you're it. Question, yeah, you're questioning the structure based on just the music alone. Right. I find that to be a much a, a larger issue in the next song, Dove. All right, let's not look at that. Really. Plural. Anyway. Oh, it is plural. Yeah. Doves. Um, I mean, the, though this song, I mean. Well, yeah. For one, I would say that the song was more subdued than any of the other songs that we've heard. It was definitely the most mellow. I would mellow. say it started out as a ditty, actually. It just started out with drum, sort of a tinny piano. Almost seemed like a throwaway idea to me, to be honest, in the very beginning. But it, it did blend nicely into the full riff with the whole slides and the synth and distinctly some bongos in the background. Really? Yes. Huh. Hmm. And but, now I can't even begin to remember what the song sounds like. Well, yeah, I'm having... You say bongos, and I'm like, a derp? <laughs> <laughs> no, it just added a little bit of an exotic element for me, which I think, I, I, it solidified this as a summer album for me, actually. This was one of the more warm tracks I had had up to this point. Um, but the issue I'm getting with this is now, because the music is taking a little bit of a step forward, I'm noticing it's becoming very repetitive in the riffing. There's not a lot of evolution once the main theme is built. That was my second observation. That's 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 where as of the voice, I I, I felt like the melody as a result of the whole halting thing, Kids, which it's I do not fully meshed because of that. Uh, I, I want to kind of just premise this by saying I almost hate to to bring up this point because it seems like the the whole premise of his style is based on that haltingness. He does it even you know to varying degrees in every single track, but you know maybe not to all of our uh, chagrin. I mean, well, with this song, I think that... I don't know that I agree quite as much with John so harshly on that it doesn't mesh. mesh. I think that there are definitely moments within the song, especially in the very beginning, where the voice is very distinct from the the music. And it, there's a little bit of a separator, but it's intentional. And it blends as the song goes on. I don't think it's really a standout. It's just John is 
disappointing. That said, though, I'm also might be hearing things that's more connective than John is. Um, well, this does turn around for me, though. It turns around about eh, halfway through the song. But first, let's just uh, move chronologically here. Let's get to the chorus. The the backup singers step in, and and the driving guitar distortion kind of helped this out a little bit because the song already sort of had an air of long to it. So you know, this this to me was a very appropriate use, I think, of distortion. It just enhanced the mood. But then when we go into verse two, which you'd think, all right, that's going to be a carbon copy of verse one, it it wasn't. The the singing. It's like he used this moment to sort of reach into the uppermost portion of his registers and push his abilities to their very limit. And I got the same thing I got out of, uh, what was it, track, both tracks one and two at that moment. That's what I like to see from his singing. I think that's where it shines best. And that happened halfway through this track because at that moment it was it was more like a song. It was less like an Adderall trip. <laughs> it's just, such a specific way I can, to put it. I can, I can kind of see all that. I mean, uh, in my my version, I disliked the complications he was throwing in with the synth, with the tinny notes and things like that, because it felt like yeah, it that's was not a complication. Yeah, that's the, the synth, same riff that has been since the beginning of the that track. No, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about throughout the whole song. The the, the complications. The, the randomness of that synth just kind of broke it apart for me. I don't remember I've, being pretty random at all. I, I remember being the really same, a, a, a repeat of the same riff. I think it's just maybe no, the repetition no, not, that's bothering you. Yes, it, it was <laughs> random for what he first introduced. I didn't feel like that element meshed well with what he was setting up and what he'd already set up in the previous tracks. Because his vocal is not that divergent from what he's already been singing but he's trying something a well, little I am bit outside agree that what the I like. tinniness, and this was, like I said, was my first comment here, that I thought it was a throwaway idea. I don't know. I, I'm a little undecided yet at this moment as to how it kind of wore on me as the track went on. All I know is that I shifted my focus to the vocals, which is where they needed to be right then, because that was the most interesting thing at the time. But, but the, the, I do agree that maybe the, the idea wasn't as blended. I mean, it was a very odd... It was a... It's it's a very tinny piano melody. It seemed like the kind of thing you could just hash out, and then it's like, all right, well, throw it on repeat. I, yeah, and I think it was distracting for me. I really couldn't get past it. I I, I stopped noticing it, but yeah. that was just me. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I can understand where you're coming from, and I can see where you would feel that, but I just... I, I was able to let it wash over me and move past me, and then certainly I... Certainly wasn't a complication, though. It was no. a... It was a reiteration. A what? A simplification? <laughs> it was the exact opposite of what you said. I'd say it's a reiteration. That's all a reiteration. Yeah, I like. I, I think that makes more sense. Right, so and he I, doesn't like things repeating. Don't keep saying reiteration. If we keep repeating that he doesn't like things repeating, he'll get upset that we're repeating that no, things repeating. Wait, can, can you reiterate that again for me? Forget <laughs> both. Of you. Forget all of you. I love techno, and that is the most repetitive thing in the universe. Forget excluding you, pulsars. I, I was going to ask what pulsars are, but I don't want to know. Never mind. We're moving on. You don't know what they pulsars pulse. are. They no, actually I know just I mean, pulse. No, I will have this deal. digression. It's about science. Can you imagine him watching <laughs> jellyfish? Just like, bloop, bloop. I don't like jellyfish. They sting. They repeat. I got stung by a jellyfish as a child. I don't they like just them anymore. Repeat. I want that bloop sound bite. They you just have repeat. To, you have to give that, that, yeah, that bloop, bloop to me bloop. later. Bloop, bloop. There you go. You can bloop. separate that right out. Bloop. I'll make you a recording. <laughs> For my left. It'll be your meditation. Otherwise, the lower registered bass... Um, the bongos, even, were meshing well with what he was doing emotionally. Yeah, he added like a Rastafarian thing, and I say that very lightly. Are we going to the next song on this? Or. No. Are we still. We're still in dubs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's on him. <laughs> um, it was. It was. I, yeah, Rastafarian might be stretching it a little bit too much, and that's me saying that. Um, I can see hints of it, though. And I mean. All in all, this song, this track wasn't as memorable as probably any other track on the record for me. So I get where John's coming from, even though I still liked the track, but it didn't have as many standout moments as just about every other track on the record. Yeah, and I'm also just gonna close the the lid on that that idea quickly, but only because the bongos are not the not the reason why it felt slightly Rastafarian to me. It, was his it comes down to his voice yeah. because they almost feel like they could be could be sung by like a you know a caribbean or or Tr- trinidadianese i believe that's the right trinidadian Trinidad- there you go you're welcome yeah. why is it not just caribbean um go with caribbean yeah well, because the, i happen to know a couple west of other trinidadian west, west indies. indies i like that there you west go. indies is generally the overarching term there you go 
Also, I worked at a West Indies event as a statue, and it was reggae covers of literally everything. Oh, boy. And yeah, even. But I believe this is just a white dude, so. Well, no, it's three white dudes, actually. Ah, there we go. It's so, three white dudes. You know. Canceled. And they look about as comforting as they sound, if that makes sense. Like the oh, it does, actually. Like, just has this very, no, it wears does. a black t-shirt, and you're like, oh, you'd be a nice guy to lie in a hammock with and talk to you about things and feels. <laughs> So I think this is a good way, a good place to move on to uh, track five. We've had like five reasons at the moment. <laughs> That's also true. Now we are moving on to track five because reasons. Because reasons, exactly. Uh, back, back in, in the, the tall grass. grass. Did you guys plan that? No, not at all. We're always succinct. Um, succinct. I love the imagery. <laughs> in sync. <laughs> in sync. <Same> That's, <laughs> no, it's not. I've Sean, heard both what's wrong ways. With... No, it's been were... said both ways. Succinct means to be short. And to the point, in sync means to be in rhythm with something. Or like a boy my way band. Better. Or um, a boy band. This had uh, <laughs> a little some more uplifting. Some of the best imagery of the entire album, just it's because so of the descriptive. It's it's the it has such a heavy natural aspect that it does an amazing job of just painting the picture of what he's creating here. Let's let's get down to. I want to start off with music for once here. Can we do that? Sure. The bass here I'll allow it. just hammers the root. It's it's C almost exclusively, and it starts off like every eighth note in a riff that sometimes inclu- throws in the five, but it's very cyclical. It's much like driving down a long, empty road and not giving a care in the world, which is funny that this is so descriptive, or you, you see it as, as imagery-rich, and indeed it is, but it's the kind that you'd experience... I suppose, on a trip, and yet it makes so many references to home. And I think the cyclical nature of that rhythm makes me feel like I'm forever moving away from that home, and, and I can't return to it. I perhaps Well, then again, cyclical would also mean that maybe you'd find you your way back. back again, but that's not the way I was feeling in this particular track. But I want to continue that a little further here, because we get a rhythmic change-up where the bass line steps away from those eighth notes to a, sort of a group of, of three sixteenth notes, all in the three four one, three four one, da da dun da da dun da da dun that kind of, that, that cycle. So it's a new stage of cyclical bass work, and yet it's all on the root. It's all C major. It's as comfortable and close to home as you could get, which is why I premised this by saying it was uplifting, because compared to all the previous tracks, I don't really get any foreshadowing here. It seems like a kind of nulling track. And I unlike agree. unlike Spirit, where his emphasis was playing around with what the synth and beat work was doing, uh, here, his emphasis is being built upon that bass. And his vocals are built upon the bass, and just, f- they flourish. They're doing so well on st- sticking to that very steady, comfortable feeling. Mm-hmm. And to laying everything on top of that. That is your foundation. Frankly, there's very... His building is beautiful. Frankly, there's very little else going on, but yeah. that's not... I, I mean, I haven't really... I haven't really figured out where case, to place that yet, because again... That's not again, a detractor in this case. I don't want anything more, because here it's all about him just crooning what he's going to croon. Well, see, I said it was nulling, Also worth not mentioning, boring. I believe this song is actually the last song on the first side of the record, of the vinyl. It's such a great hmm. song to end. It's this nice, warm wrap-up. Do especially you know I mean? when you go into the right this song is so great especially the one step takes me home that those those four steps mm. um it's such a great last side last song on side track you know because it's just like but and that and, and he it's planned, also the I'm so sure they planned the inflection it he's got you know? on that yeah. that line so sure long way home just mm-hmm. the the dozens of different ways he says it throughout the song. Mm-hmm. Each has a different level of emotion and a different type of, it's of emotion. It's a very round way of saying home. It just evokes mm. his warm home. Like, and he'll he bring really it did, up. He really did he bring it, it down, down for this. It's not it so up. much that it's, outward passion. It's, it's, it's inward. It's intimate. He's lowering yeah. his voice to a very intimate range. But take, but I want to take apart that whole, that whole paragraph right there. That whole stanza. One step takes me home. Two steps back on my own. Three skips to each stone. Four steps back and I'm gone. Just 
put it out there, that's great writing. Oh, it is. The three rhymes and then changing it on the last line is, I mean, it makes it so much more it's impactful. It's slightly off rhyme when yeah, it yeah. quite also, syncs up. He actually just says, like, right, the, the, the line right before that is words jump like salmon. He's like, I'm going to play with some language. Yeah. He's yeah. foreshadowing in his Heads own up. song. There's the moments go, I mean, later, later in this album, I think the, the playing with language gets even mm-hmm. more rich. He's, and uh, and that's not something I had noticed initially, but it, it starts fulfilling itself. It also brings back the theme work from Seasons that was built into a little bit of spirit with it feels like winter but it's the heart of summer once again going back to the seasons mm-hmm. uh once again going going back to this uh natural nature oriented imagery uh which i i'm starting to see this a duality probably f- what season does salmon run is it like fall uh fall oh. fall. fall primarily yeah. so now this is a fall song right because he's got the minnows and things mm. and, and even the cattails, yeah and the, yeah, and the tall grass and actually yeah okay we're, we're well, the fall. salmon go home right because when salmon jump up river they're going back to where they were born and it does say but, it's, it feels like winter but it's the heart of the summer mm. it's showing it's, well it's, it's august you know in the brink late late <laughs> august yeah <laughs> his biggest rumination seems to be when he's talking about nature mm-hmm. in this theme work. When he starts getting into the celestial, we start seeing that fey element coming in. Mm-hmm. And here the fey is completely gone. Well, this is super earthy, right? He's in that backwater running through the woods. like That's all yeah. he is. Right, he's grounding it. It's, it's him reimagining mm-hmm. what he used to call home. It's him remembering the safe place of his life. But let's remember the album. So solid. Let's remember the album here. I think I want to take this that next direction and say that home of course is where he was with the aforementioned girl and i believe we were already told that this 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 breakup occurred in summer we we're told that as early as the very first track and i believe this is immediately after the fact and this is some kind of nulling sense of running away from it all and that would attribute to why there's no there, there's so much reliance on nature and not the celestial yeah he's it's, trying to ground himself yeah and it's it, he talks about how did grounding, he get here? Grounding She's himself here. in running away, which is the funny thing. Because right. we're a lo- okay. The well, lines. He's sinking his feet into the earth. Ex- no, exactly. Because we're a long way from home. A long way from home. How did we get here? She's still present in his thoughts, but she's not at this place anymore. Right. Yeah. That's why it's it's just the levels of imagery. There's so much thought put into the words he's using. I'm I'm really seeing a, just a. A mastermind behind this. Mm-hmm. Well, well, and in the the idea of going back, right? He's in the backwater. He's looking in the mirror, thinking of her. He's looking at something that's looking back at him. He's in the backwater. He's looking back. He's got all this going back. Also, pay attention to the mirror because it, haha, comes back later. But the magic is gone. She's gone. Right. That's why that that level is is gone. And He's the like funny thing, the going back thing though. But the yeah. funny thing though, yeah, he of course he hammers. He that hammers. Home. And that's why the the saddest thing about this track is the fact that it may very well just be him running on a treadmill. Oh, it could be. That actually is not a terrible idea. I mean, just the sense that of course we are home. We really clear they are never leaving. He's giving all these all the, this imagery that implies that, but yet you don't feel that musically. Musically, I mean, I I did say it feels it feels cyclical, and I'm actually starting to starting to think about that now. That it does seem to always just come back home. There's even a moment in the bass where it steps in, where I, like I said, that constant hammering of C, and then all of a sudden it just you know jumps up. It was one of your favorite moments, Matt. Actually, when the bass just jumps up a little bit higher, mm-hmm. jumps up to the two, down to the seven, and back to one, almost straying barely enough to remind you where home was. Right. Well, it's this kind of also the sound that. Not so obvious that it's like, here's a thing, you know, look at me, but not so subdued that you miss it. It's, it's, it's a very, just it's a very sweet moment. but noticeable music moment. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's, it's a, a mo- gentle... <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah. Actually, yeah, it's, it very much is. It's, it's a throat clear, a... A catch subtle, his throat. A yeah. subtle catch. throat clear. Yeah. The hiccup in his, uh, <laughs> in his little rumination here. Um, but yeah, that's uh, what I get from this song. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think there's a good point to go to... Another song that also I feel is very warm and possibly one of the most emotional songs, at least for me. On okay, well, record. Uh, I'm, let's this... just start by disagreeing with you on the very beginning here. This was a dark exposition. Well, I'm getting to that. So well, please let's... let me finish my point. All right, all right. Thanks. Chronology. So, Gotta do chronology. And it's here, so shush. Um, the song is called A Song for Our Grandfathers. And the warmth I'm talking about is not a warmth in one's heart, but actually a warm, murky muggy feeling. Oh, wow. This, this, well, if you'd let me finish my <laughs> sentence, I would have said that. Warm has more than one meaning yes. as a word. 
And John's telling you that. That's sad. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> I'll wait this out. <laughs> anyway, so this song, because it starts with the, this, these wonderful sound bites of peepers, you were saying they're called? They're peepers. They're little frogs Small that you frogs. hear during in like swampy areas when they're doing their mating thing. Like crickets, they won't shut up when they want to get laid. But they're kind of more gentle than crickets. So the, these sounds leading into the wow. actual <laughs> instrumentation of the song <laughs> gave this kind of warm, swampy, murky feeling. Like you're in the middle of a wooded area. Through the woods and running to loose leaf. Like yeah. you have the mulchy, slightly rotting leaves. He's got the smoke that danced when he took a drag. He's got his grandmother watching And him. so while it has a darker tone, I felt that was lent to this kind of wooded kind of scene he was sending, setting. Okay. It's an then I, I would have I maybe just would have used another term than just saying sort of warm. It, it's 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 like humid. It feels oppressive. It yeah. feels thick. It, yeah, exactly. Okay. It, it, kind of, there we because go. I've been in I've, I've I've done word day finding day. words. I'm well, there's the just words. so much imagery we have to use the thesaurus to describe this album. I am your local thesaurus. But uh, nice. this one, I'm gonna I'm gonna be know. with with uh, Matt on this one. This is probably the most emotional song. Uh, definitely to date on this album, but for me, this becomes my most emotional song because it is an aftermath type of a song. There's a lo- a desolate kind of a nature, an empty nature in this song. Just in the quivers he's throwing in his voice here, just in in how he's using his vocals um, and the lyrics that he's doing, it, it they're just hollow. Like, he can't really put too much emphasis into it. He cannot invest the same way he used to be able to. But see, that's just why the exposition was a lot more interesting than, I think, the quote-unquote development of this track, because it can seem very hollow and very almost stagnant in that regard, or, or subdued, is that the exposition had it, it was rich with all of this... this, uh, this setting painting right here. You have this, this, this oppressive environment the the synth steps in in the very beginning right over those screeching frogs and gives peeping. out this this hum look at peepers peepers they're peeping they don't screech they peep they're peeping they're gentle and then you peeping. got the hum over them it's just a perfect octave that contracts into a major seventh which i found very unsettling at this point and i'm using that word and i'm not changing it this time i totally out. agree no right. and this song it this, actually and this song then, is completely backed up by that and then we break out with the oppressive computerized synth um well it's already computerized but it again harkens back to boards of canada we have this this sort of a chord progression here that ironically enough i think it was trying to force comfort through a very disturbed backdrop. And that is... A, that's a very poetic way to put it, because I felt that. I definitely felt that. Well, I'm not... Um, I mean, I'm not, I don't know if it's a positive thing yet, but I know not. this. You have... The chord changes are 1-5-2. I mean, these are basic pivot chords. So I felt a little... At this point, I felt a little ripped from the potential artsiness of the exposition. At the same time, there was that that overall tone to these chord changes that felt like there could have been some stray harmony in there that was tossing in a dissonance so that when you get these very comfortable pivot chords, you're you're not really enraptured by each and every one of them. And that that's another example, one five two. One five two, it's it's a kind of coming home again. That's what these pivot chords do very often is bring you back. And yet it just keeps straying far enough to bring you back. But the it's so much darker than the previous track like the previous track was saying it lightly because he was deluded and now all of a sudden it he can't delude himself any longer well, but he's you staring still feel at ghosts it. he's listening to ghosts and he's not afraid of them there you are. but he's surrounded by ghosts and thinking of his probably what will probably be dead grandparents right just the lines and i love what happens with this line they said that if i stared and this is when almost everything but the bass and the little backdrop of the beat are playing. They said that if I stared, the abyss would stare back at me. So I did. And I felt it slowly creep in me. That is exactly mm-hmm. what you're talking about. Uh-huh. So, and see, this is just from the music I got. This I had barely even looked at the lyrics at this point. This well, is this the is, power that music has, me. and I love when music can actually fulfill these, these kinds of ideas themselves. So you're on board. Because you, you were talking about that you weren't on board, and now you're on board. Was I? Yeah. He said you weren't quite going for it, but now you're going for it. When That's did that thing. happen? When he first was explaining about it, he said he wasn't quite going for it. 
I missed that. There might be. A no, part. I was no, I was describing my experience with this. Like for instance, when it went back to one five two, I'm like, what is there, and yet not quite right about it. That's what I was not quite on board with. Well, you had to get into his work, his actual lyrical content in this one. Well, I already had the previous tracks to go off. You chopped his lyrical off. content right in the middle of a sentence there. So. Oh, I like that. No, so I did. And then the next sentence, if you read it like you would read poetry, and I felt it slowly creep in me, save for the smoke with, that danced when I took a drag. I see, you almost called it that. You, you gotta continue. It like, it's a it very like, flowing tale. It made me think about the way it all came to be. That sinks it. Because he's like, it crept into me except for the smoke, which curled. Yeah. Um, you can't chop a line in a poem in half. People like to cut them at the end of a line. Like, you, you read a poem... And every time there's a, a return key, people stop. But that flows into the next line, and then there's a comma. So it's, that slowly crept in me, save for the smoke. The smoke didn't creep into him. The smoke danced when he took a drag. That's the, you have to finish the line to make that the big. The big structure. If you're going to talk about that paragraph, you have to read the whole thing. <laughs> Which supports everything we were just saying. So right. I've been quiet for an extended period of time, so I think we got him that. <laughs> I'm going to start throwing things. At Steve, please don't. You'll hit the computer. I meant in general. Oh. Just sit on your hands. <laughs> sit on your hands. Um, but yeah, no, I think we're all in agreement that this song is very poignant. It's very f- focused in what it's trying to deliver. And it succeeds on every level. If, if I had... I mean, here's the thing. I was... If I'm going through the, the track chronologically, I, I did have a few other observations. I mean... For one thing, the bass seemed very raw here. Kind of like it was mic'd straight from the amp, which we hadn't gotten up to this point. We get the crispness right. that is, is more uh, more that of like a direct mic input. Or well, like the kind of merge of the two, which is a little bit more common. The foundation of this whole album seems to be built upon the main character being the bass. Everything he sings ends up being backed up by that bass. So in this instance, having it raw, sort of uncensored... It shows that he's not in that good place he was before. This is definitely a shakier ground for him, a, a darker emotional time for him. I'd buy that. I would only be aware of just saying that the main character <laughs> I- I- is the base necessarily. The main well, character is obviously supported. him. That's, that's, his, that, 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 that's his stance, his, his ground he's chosen. Exactly. It's, another, it's an important, most important element of the setting, perhaps, is the base, because it shows where he is and seems to follow him along every single portion of this journey. So I definitely see that. Well, yeah, and it blends really well with like the doubling of his voice that he does in this track that's so clearly being done. That's him doubling himself at these two ranges quote unquote but the, you know just it adds another level to that factor the depth yeah the depth it just it, it adds to support that that dark place that he's in it gives that eeriness it reduces the solidity of the character when you start breaking apart when you start fracturing yeah, it, like it that. seems warbly which is a word i've been using a lot lately Bur- warbly All warbly right. that's a um, good word i like that one more thing as i listen on to the sort of the progression of this melody, of the structure, of everything in this track, is that I realized this was a band that derives its power from not being in a rush, but yet its hindrance sometimes seems to be its lack of destination. But I don't think, like, I think, you know, we've already sort of proven in this track that that's not really, that's almost, that's almost moot just because we we see ourselves in a, in a particular place in time dealing with a certain thing and we have to continue dealing with it. That's the, the state of, of rumination, especially the kind that is, uh, that is um, detrimental, but just that that slowness of the band. It's almost borderline chill wave. You just sort of sit and let his voice and these these simple, desperate sounds kind of sweep over to you. And I'm honestly, it, it's a it's a little hit or miss with me at times. So I did find myself, even though I enjoyed the the raw emotion of this track, I did find myself occasionally pausing to say, where is this track going, or or can I, you know. Can I just sit here and be immersed in this? You can be immersed by some things, you can't be immersed by others, and that's very hit or miss with, with most listeners. I definitely agree with that. I wasn't quite as immersed in uh, Doves, or even to some extent uh, Sun in the Morning, but this part here, I'm fully wallowing in what he's what he's spewing. I even have one more thing that, that sort of... Th- this is kind of a... <clears throat> it's a... Um, it's another one of those little instrumental things. It's more of an yeah. interlude when the synth- instrumental. instrumental, yeah, <laughs> it's a term he coined. coined a while back. <laughs> but um, 
the it's like a, a major scale these just these major scale instruments would be five four three four three two five four three four six five and that means nothing just like saying it out loud but it's just if you were to play that out on the major scale it's the kind of idea that like it ties these two phrases together very well because it's this little interlude just inserted there where the synth just takes over and just starts to little play this little mini melody but it, it's the kind of idea that's almost so blissfully unambitious because it doesn't seem to go anywhere that even that, even as much as the idea itself musically may not be my cup of tea, it may not seem to have uh, a future written all over it, it just it, it goes with the theme of the track yet again. It all seems to come back to him being in this state of rumination, so it's like... It's like feeling constrained in every way possible. The vocalist feels constrained. These little instrumentals feel constrained. Everything is just limited and trudging along. But it's intentional. Right? Well, because he's he's go, he's going in mental circles. He's thinking about the same thing over and over and over again. Exactly. Like that's the, the, the pure, definition the permutations of, of it. Yeah, like, exactly. He's well. That's why, right? Yeah. <laughs> he's just forcing you to circle with him. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. he's dragging Come you down with him. Come on, this lonely journey with me. I have one me. thing to think about. Let us think about it together. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so. And yeah, and I mean, it also connects really well to the next track, Lighthouse, because this is a song where you get, we've gotten enough of his darkness at this point. We know that he looks at himself as this person who maybe isn't worthy or can't be saved or isn't worth it. He looks into abysses. Yes. And he looks into abysses, yeah. He looks into abysses. And And Lighthouse, we're finally getting a a small chunk of of another perspective, even though it's through his perspective. I had the same experience here. You go from completely his perspective almost entirely to a point where you go, oh, we have someone else's perspective. Mm -hmm. In theory, the she, the one that he's been ruminating over. And through that, we get the detail. Yeah. Yeah. And, and And the song structure gives this kind of sense, Lighthouse, that he's remembering. It's not actually her. It's him it may remembering. Not even be correct. It might not even be right. He might be remembering it wrong. But it's him remembering Well, it. he's asking over and over again. He says, like, I couldn't see you. What was that you said? What was that you said? And then he says, I couldn't catch you. What was that you said? What was that you said? I don't remember exactly yeah. what it was. That and you I like this me. idea that it's him plucking at beads of light that he can remember through his own memory of someone else about him. The stuff it's this kind of out. loop that really adds a cycle to the song that really makes a strong emotional connection. Well, let me hone well, in on me... that loop just for a second here because I had I had I had two reactions. The first was that the, this is almost like that of like a movie exposition here. I mean the way the chords just step in and it's this powerful like minor one to the five and the three, sometimes the four for good measure, it's kind of like filling out this classic forlorn intro. And yet the drums and the bass just keep it moving like you're you're running through all this 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 sorrow around you. And yet the verses here are rather long because we're getting all of that information. We're being told the details for the first time in, you know, his his classic cagey sense. But yet we do get a little bit. What was that you said? Nothing hurts this much. But I've seen the way that bodies lie and bodies tend to break. It's a to and fro between them. The first time we actually have, yeah, right, conversation instead of um, reflective conversation instead of... uh, him in his own head, imagining the way it should have gone, or or well, the way he wanted it to go. He doesn't believe her. He's like totally contradicting her. Yeah, it, and it's she it's, kept, she keeps saying not so bad things, you know, and he keeps. It's 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 so cliche though. I gotta point this out. Oh, it's it so cliche. Is. I don't want to Light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. You're not as bad. This is Beauty and the Beast. I showed you the dark inside of me. Mm-hmm. It's Beauty and the Beast. That's exactly so what bad. it is. I'm a beast. You'll never love me. I do. He's he into the you. light. This is not yeah. you. This is not but you. But here's the thing. He takes this really cliche idea and does a beautiful job of invigorating it. Of, of giving it life outside of just the cliche itself. Of really making it his own. It. Making it personal. Um... <laughs> I, want, and, and I suddenly honestly, want her to be a total indie chick with, like, short hair, like, clutching his hands on a park bench. <laughs> oh, jeez. I mean, it's, it is a little bit of Trying to breathe, breathe in life to this depressing, sad man. This is the part we be started, his, yeah. His Natalie Portman. We, we, oh. Exactly. This is the part where we started naming oh, indie films of, like that. His, her, his, her relationship with uh, Devendra Banner. Her Mona Flowers but is all of that. What yes. happens in this God. song, which kind of doesn't happen too much, is the vocals are the progressive part. The, mm-hmm. the the music 
remains so safe and steady. The lyrics the vocal, are the progressive part. No, the vocals. Didn't find he changes. The vocals. His inflection evolves. His inflection is the slow burn of this song, getting to become more energized, more more full of life, more full of that that kind of hope that she once visited upon. Well, make, let me make a distinction here because again, chronology wise, <clears throat> verse. Verse, I felt like I had sung, heard the song already. I felt like his voice just was not varied enough at this moment for me. The chorus, I admit, bit of a pickup, just because the the mixing of the vocals was such that I was very in tune with everything he was saying. It was it was lifted a little bit, sounded closer to my ear. He sounded crisp, clear, earnest, and it seemed like the volume kind of combated everything else. The, the structure of the melody was helping too. It moved the chord progression, um, but the main thing for me was going back to the words. It was. The fact that he applied his unique style of singing to various words here. And this is where we get, you know, again, a little playing with writing here. I, I, I had a moment. Let's move ahead to, and this is where we were when I showed you the dark. <laughs> Inside of me, in spite of me, on a bench in the park. <laughs> you know, it's, it's almost silly when you break it down like that. Yeah. But specifically with the way he sings, it does get a motive at this point. Yeah. So in the beginning, it seemed very flat. But as he moves through the story, he starts getting more intense. So yes, when he starts saying that line, this is where we were when I showed you the duck. And everything is so... He's, he's back to that, that style that I love. The stuttered style. Putting really, really harsh emphasis on consonants. It kind of, you feel his passion through that. That's what I'm talking about. He does, he goes from that, that verse one, very numb sound, to more lively, to actually starting to see that, that lighthouse effect, that light at the end of the tunnel, mm-hmm. coming the, back to him. The through line of this song is the slow burn of the lyrical build. And the, uh, well, the vocal build. The lyrical build, I mean, to an extent, but it's mostly the vocal build. The fact that he starts so flat and builds to this strong emotion, it really, he, the thing that makes this song not get boring or tiring, for me, at least, is the way he brings you along. Because he's building this emotion at such a slow pace, you're intrigued and you're along for the ride. You want to know where this is going because you're also getting the first positive light that you've really seen in the whole song. In the whole album. Which you know, is weird because he's talking about how deep and dark and brooding and bad person but, he is. But it's another perspective. Or how he showed her what he thought he was. Right. And I think that that's the real strength of this song. It, what makes it so engaging. That emotional connection from wanting to go along for the ride. That, that ending of, and you said to me, you know... What you know is better is brighter. Just the way he keeps playing around with those it's inflections. Better, brighter, yeah. Those Again, inflections, because he repeats it a few times, and it's just many times, yeah. the changes that he's putting into it. He's seeing it from a new light. He's seeing it's this like past. It's like he almost believes it. Well, it's interesting, It's the right? color coming back into him. He almost, like, he almost believes it, right? Because he can't remember what she said, and he start, this like his first thing where he's contradicting her is the way the bodies lie and they break. <clears> and then... Now they're present tense, right? They're lying in each other's arms in spite of everything. They're still a we. And she says, you know what you know is better is better. And he repeats it a bunch of times. And it's like, he really... He wants... Oh, he's so close to believing her for that horrible moment. And then you hope he'll listen finally because he's such an emo kid. But that that's actually a great point to to connect to the next song because I feel like the fact that he's just repeating it as if to, to believe it, to dream it's true... It, it well, re- she says it's true and he's like, yeah, but... Yeah, <laughs> but but your take on that, just the the present tense, past tense thing. I mean, are are, are you are you saying that he's sort of putting himself in the present tense, back, like reflectively? He might or... be flashing back and forward, and this is where I am in my head at this very moment. I don't think it matters if it's actually happening at that moment. I think, or it's no, present fair for enough. Him. It just seems like a very strong thing. The fact that he paired those two back to back because he starts off as, um, and this is where we we were. When I showed you the dark inside of me, in spite of me, on a bench in the park, Maybe. and this is where we are in your bed, in my arms. That that's that pair is Maybe very strong. When when she said, "This is not you. This is not you." That's where we were. We were on a bench. At, at at that point in time, where you said that thing to me, that's where we were. And now, where we are now, that you're saying, "You know what you know is better." This is where we are in this moment. That you're saying yeah. that to me. It's the two he just, might be okay. establishing yes. scenes. Like yes. where were we when you said that thing? Where were, where, um, or he said, um, you know, uh, at the very beginning, it was like when I couldn't see you for the wall and when I couldn't catch you, about, what did you say? Yeah. Before you called, where were we at that moment? It's where like almost as if he's moment? in the room yeah. asking her. Um, now that we're sitting right here, you said something just now. Yeah. Um, and that was that you're he's better, you're Mostly just establishing, like, 
you know, like, he's brooding. It's fine. Like, I like by the, a wall. Like it's, it's this brooding. is the scene. This yeah. is the scene. This is the scene. I yeah. like the play with time here yeah. because, and I think that that really goes back to that sort of movie exposition that I felt mm-hmm. because those chords keep they keep moving through these varying stages. And actually, when you break apart the music of this track, it's probably the most developmental. But then it sometimes it revisits the earlier the er, those earlier <clears throat> chord progressions. And then it, it pushes that forward with a little bit more intensity, like it's the same situation then, but also going on now, yeah. with even greater connotations, or with even more dire consequences, perhaps. Yeah. Like, you know, you are unchanged, I have changed. There's all these various ways you could see this through, but I like, I like that sense of... Um, of seeing the past and then seeing the present and the music reflects that. And possibly that. not knowing like what tense are you in. That sort of adds to the whole dreamlike weird quality of the album. That's been my whole. experience the entire right, album. It's, it's yeah. Just a, like, Where not, am not I? Trippy, when was this? Not trippy so much. It's just like he sends you this massive picture and it's like I don't need to know necessarily. He definitely, I think he, because he sends the massive picture in the beginning with the the span of seasons, I he think may this not is, know where he is either. He, yeah, he, he. I think you know that kind of goes back to that Adderall trip thing. I think he is just lost in himself. Well, it's, it's also it's lends, really, you're right. It may not be important well, in the end. It, it also lends the idea of you know the dream state, and that he he might not even be sure where he is. He's just kind of. Try, it's the idea of remembering, and you don't always remember everything accurately. I think it lends to that too that he might be remembering a lot of this because we're not sure what point in time he's in, and he might not be remembering it rightly. We right. repress things. It would be yeah, like a time things. fugue almost. That's it's not that's, having a fugue well, I get, I go per se, that. but it's got sort of that vibe of a fugue. It yeah. could be. This is. Um, I don't know what it's known fugue as. Fugue is if you see two parts moving different directions, which is. I mean, it's him like and her. Psycho- that's a hard, but psychological fugue. I'll buy it. Well, so, uh, fugues are. I don't know who I am, but maybe it's. I don't know where I am. Yeah. Or when? When I am. Another exploration in time, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a common literary thing to do in fiction to get a. To show a character growing beyond the low station he's in at a specific point is for him to reflect upon the past and choose that sensei, that person who brought out the light in him, that that hero he has, and have them say what they would say back then to him now, if you get what I'm getting at. Oh, that they have that vision on the mountain. Yeah. yeah the person who once idea. trained them, like, appears before them. Or that person that always believed in you and you're at a low state, so now... What would they say to, to you if they could see you now? Mm, what well, would be their advice to make you go forward? Right, like he's yeah. drifting at sea right now. She's the lighthouse that's calling him back to the thing. Yes, he sees the light in the yeah, fog. I wouldn't even I, say. I, I wouldn't even say they're together. I don't think they there, not be. there is yeah. no presence tense here. We don't have to be near this a is lighthouse, him. right? Yeah, you know, <laughs> this is him just saying. He's so subtle. Back then, you helped me. How would you help me now? That's what I'm seeing here. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's I an like, interesting idea. I like, I like that. that. I like that theory too. I think. Yeah, this com- I mean, it's not it's not as if he's doing something boldly new because also this is he's employing these these literary tools like the one you're mentioning and yet also the uh just the the concept of sort of doing that 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 pair back to back and yet changing up one crucial word. Like I actually remember mm-hmm. specifically uh back in episode eighty six we reviewed Saint Vincent Saint Vincent and there was a track uh Prince Johnny in which the whole entire track is about this 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 boy who's sort of on the brink of, of of losing himself in in scenarios, and I think he he she goes as far to imply suicide, and it's all this, um, this all about him, all about him. You you were on your knees to praying to God to to make me a real boy, right? And then he does she does that flip where it's I prayed to make me a real girl, yeah. and this kind of like antithesis, like um, the story is filling out just based on one little word shift, and that's that's the it's it's a it's commonly done across. I've seen this done, but almost almost exclusively, it's 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 hit big with me because that one literary tool fulfills the storyline that you can sometimes spend tracks and tracks meandering around. That was like the the pivotal moment in this track in this album. Mm. Okay. Um, and then of course also I just like to see the whole lyric melody matrimony when it comes to the uh, you know those little quirks that he throws in with like showed you the dark in spite of me I mean inside of me in spite of me these little rolls and twists that he does with his voice his almost slant rhymes yeah actually yeah. Yeah. that it, it kind of gives me a reason to just enjoy mm. the fusion of music and lyrics whereas you know when it comes to lyrics well I could just have poetry when it comes to music well I could just have an instrumental clearly prior to this we had music moments that that conveyed the same message to me without lyrics needed to be 
needing to be inserted, and yet here we have a fusion of the two. It gives you a reason to want the fusion of the, fusion of the two. So it's a strong thing for me personally. Um, now we go on to Like the Moon, which is track eight. Um, this takes us kind of back to that dreamy, ethereal state. Um, kind of? I'm all right. Very much so. From from this, this from this from from lighthouse, we go into a song like the moon that you you're thrust into this dream state again. You know, it's a very airy sense of being. This is the Fay back. Mm-hmm. The the woman. May or may this not is be. this is more focused yeah. upon her as opposed to the last few tracks. Uh, a lot of simile. She is a simile in this song. This is just trying to encapsulate her in the words. Mm. Um, and yet, the funny thing is the placement of this track, and that's important because of what we've been told about the story. So now, I mean, so far now, you can't take this track seriously, and it, he knows that, and that's why some of these lines come off as so numbingly cliched, like the moon, so close and set yet so far. She says, like the moon. She says, it's your eyes. She sees everything. She knows me too well. He he hammers that home immediately. Yeah, he, and, she, he knows it's fake, but he's putting himself back in the time for almost no good reason at this point. Just to, he's suddenly making her that big celestial thing again, right? Because she suddenly is that omnipotent goddess. Well, I think almost. it's that that idea that it got too real really quick. In that last song, he hit an emotional ground, an almost of emotional he breakthrough. Almost so it. he yeah. immediately had to go. Nope, you're back in the sky. I gotta make Can't you do something this really big and too far away. You're away. She looks well, like the day. Which, she which makes like it very it's a common it's a common thing I think for many to to sort of spooks self aggrandize yeah, exactly. spooks himself really yeah. badly. Yeah. Because that's the thing. We like to ingra- self aggrandize. Like our own lives are our own story because that's obviously the lens in which we see. How could we possibly take ourselves out of ourselves? So we'd like to make our own experiences seem so grand and so broad and the, you know, when it's dragged down for you, when it's when it's kind of uh beaten out of you through through experience, I, I it's only natural to kind of revert and self-promote, you know, yeah. what I saw was, was the sun, was the moon, it was exactly everything I planned he, it to he, be. <laughs> and, and it's often, whenever one gets near an emotional breakthrough, you can crash and revert or go into crisis, because you don't, you're so close to believing it, you don't want to believe because it's terrifying. But if, yeah. but if he does believe her, like, she really is human, like, he can yeah. listen to her, but if she's the moon, he doesn't he, have to listen to her. He can double back on he what he's He doesn't have to listen to her, he can just well, worship also, her from afar and not have her. It also becomes an excuse as to why she's unattainable. Mm. Why yeah. she doesn't because he's got that why she's away from him why that, he doesn't have her that anymore that old song about like she's so high high above me oh that it's old, that old pop song about like she's clearly I believe it. it's she's so high she's so high the but song that's is called she's so high but that's what he's doing to her right yeah, yeah. he's making her so like Cleopatra, far. Joan of Arc and Aphrodite, Aphrodite. exactly yeah. but that's she, what this he's, reminds me of he's specifically <laughs> removing her, her from his life by putting her in the sky yeah he's making her unattainable so that he can stop being with her. And yet there's still conflict here. He's yes, still, I mean, it goes back and forth by the line. He, all of a sudden you th- he th- she throws in um, he throws in, and I can call you friend and I can be the world. Silent shatter held. I won't be around. I can be a friend, but I won't be around. Silent shatter bound. Don't push me out. There's just this internal... Like he doesn't know time, where he wants to be. It's yeah. the whole conflicted. imagery. That's, that's, that's the point of it. He is... They are separate. He, yeah. She's the moon, he's the world. Right there, they mm. never touch. I particularly like that line: "Silent chatter bound." Yeah. Silent chatter. I just, it's it, you know, you could do so much with those space. three lines. Yeah. The, vast, the vastness, the 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 All vacuum the between them, the yeah. emptiness between them. Yeah. He is fully separating I, I, her as something near him, maybe of him but no longer a part of him this I, I, to be honest I'm just throw out and say that I see from silent chatter it's the kind of thing like you're talking to someone as a friend when clearly in your head you're your saying your words you're saying so many other things yeah yeah, yeah well, no, just, no actually that's not what I was thinking more in, more in the kind of like a post relationship friendship when you're saying things to someone else and having the kind of conversations that you would otherwise associate with the relationship now all of a sudden seem to sort of be bereft of meaning this silent the chatter, oh, this, like, white noise almost. Silent chatter bound. We are bound By to white, white noise. noise 
for mm. oh, I don't, don't things, push me out though. Yeah, don't, don't, don't push me it. out. Yeah, yeah. In other words, he can't live without her. But don't push him. He can't live without her. But he hates this place. But that's what I really love about this track and why it's it's up there for me. Also, is because of that manicness the song has. It's it's almost schizophrenic because he's so he's full of fear now. It's clear that it's not just about love, whimsy, depression. Mm -hmm. There is fear in this song. And that's why he's saying and doing as he is. It's it's because of the representation he's built for for what she is to him. Right. For what the woman is. The woman is what made him chase away his darkness. Is what made him try to become a better person. She's gone. But she he cannot let her leave his orbit. Right. He can't let her leave. He doesn't want to let him. go completely, yeah. Because that's, if yeah, that were to saying. happen, I mean, that's silent chatter. That's all the conversations they can no longer have. That's all the subste- subtext. It's in all the, the conversations words they, they say. can have at the moment. It's all that they're. they're no, the silent. Sort of I, I see to. it more as the words they can't say anymore, because now they're just friends. Hmm. They can't say "I love you." They can't say all those deep meaningful. Well, that's another. I mean, that's another themes. interpretation. Right, right. But yeah. see, I, I, I. I still see the the introverted state here, such that I think it's all coming from his angle, where silent chatter is his interpretation of the words being said are now suddenly meaningless because he would otherwise associate them with relationship talk. In other with words, you have, meaning. you have a great conversation, yeah. you know, with a lover or whatnot, and then, of course, that is a pivotal conversation in your life. Everything is so much more enjoyable when you see a means to an end. When all of a sudden the end is robbed of you, then the means seem pointless. Although he almost, he has this moment, and it's funny because everything is about this back and forth, and you're the moon, you're so far, and there's a sudden moment where he almost is okay with it, right? Making a home in my body, letting it grow in my body, yeah, taking of course. these chains from it, letting it go. He has that moment, you're like, oh, Briefly, he's going to grow. He's going to grow as a human no. being, he's going to release her, he's going to grow from this, move on, accept it, and then suddenly she's the moon again. Well, yeah. then continue with that, though. Letting it go from my body, taking these chains from my body, it's harder than you know. And yeah. the funny thing about that whole entire uh, and it's stanza so is... so at odds with the it's, rest of the song, though. It's really. so on in the, between his... from one phrase to the next. Yeah. His, his inflection doesn't really vary here. His melody doesn't very really vary. It's just making a home in my body. Like, that's a statement. Letting it grow in my body. That's another statement. This is all just one train of thought, and it almost shows how, how you know, you can't really force any kind of, uh, any kind of action within to this. This is just the natural, predictable flow of the way he will react in situations like this. He will inevitably start off accepting it and feeling like he has has made advancements and can move beyond it, and then and it'll just turn yeah, right back around. He's not going to be able to do it. But he's yeah. still asking for that one thing, that one, just don't put me, just don't push me out. Yeah. It's, it, that is a, a but, that line that he keeps coming back to. Just don't say goodbye. Just yeah. don't push me out. And it's not even out. It's a how, where he has that catch he puts right in the word itself that is just, he, well, cause even it's the, that the crack. Pure thought, it's yeah. the crack of, I can't even in the say veneer anything. of the of yeah. the friendship. It's it's the, it's that little bit of you can't leave me yet. I gotta say, I'm this, not ready. Is, this is a rough song to listen to because you feel the disparity between these two people and their 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 view on the matter. And she yet, looks like the day she says it's the light. You yeah. know, she does. She doesn't take him seriously. She can't. She can't continue with this. And then, of course, it ends predictably. Something in the way she says goodbye. But that, done. but that's that lyric connects it so well to the next song because you have this. She says goodbye. She's going. That's yes. it. And then the next song is "Fall from Grace." Well, he also says, "I can be the world tonight." He's willing for one like, night. Wait, wait, wait. Like one, wait, wait, wait. wait. I, I take back everything I said. For and one, for one night, I will be the thing you revolve around. I'll be the the celestial dancer. And then you almost assume at this point she's gone, and that's why he has this fall from grace because he's it's it's done. Yeah. But there's something wrong with like the moon, and that is while lighthouse because of its beautiful simplicity in in the music here, it was just a little bit too simple for me. Actually, I had a different uh, reaction with that. I, I I felt um that sort of the 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 synth was compelling in a way that the kind of separated itself from the previous tracks the high synth particularly is really it's like a melody unto itself it exists separate from the vocal melody and it kind of echoes 
his plight in a more concise storybook type fashion because the sound is so high and so silly and so I mean it it's the exact it's it's, it's another it replica adds to of that the story. But, that, that, that yeah, almost insanity. Like, but that lower yeah, register, and it's also cyclical because every track so far has been cyclical. He always comes back to the same routine in the end. Yeah, that lower register though, I was just I wasn't quite feeling it. It didn't have it. What it didn't have the. Uh, I guess bravado of the previous tracks, but this song was not about bravado. Yeah, this, bravado. Song, not, this no. song wasn't about bravado. Not though. not the musical term, but the the whole. Those are two oof. different words. You're confusing vibrato with bravado. You said Bra- bravado, and you were right. I said the right word. Yes. Yeah, that you're just wrong use? about the song. Yes, but I'm saying there's no reason to confuse it with the musical term because there's no musical term. You're thinking of vibrato, which is a different term. Okay. Well, that did. Okay, then I said the right word. We're not sure what you meant. What are you, what no, we know exactly what you meant, and you said vibrato and you, bravado, and you were right. And continue with your thought. Oh, okay. Um, yes, it doesn't have the the foundation of the previous tracks. The, it's the not s- supposed to. But it's, it's like it's missing its main character. It's it's missing the foundation for the man. It's, it's no, it's not it's nearly not. as strong. It's, it's it's blurring that foundation because he's so manic I at this don't, point. No, 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 no. At this point, you're, you're talking about the the higher level synth. Yes, that's that's the Fey element. That's the woman element back in the song. But him, the character, the man, like his his the bass work, the the percussion work, is just doesn't speak to the same character it had been in the rest of the album. I think you're being too literal with it in this song. I think that's the problem. Is you're looking for that same character that was in every other song, which I understand, but I'm saying here it's not necessarily necessary because there it's a, it's supposed to be a lot more shattered, a lot more broken. And but I think his, that missing adds to that brokenness. But that the whole thing is he in his vocal work is so represented. Yes, and that's where I think the focus is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be focused anywhere else. In but in every, that, what I'm saying is, in every other case, just about his vocal work is so strongly backed up by the bass work. Whereas here, the bass is not necessary. The, I believe the vocals are have that strength on its own. But that is just departing from the theme work he was already building. Then no, it's not. That's a little too minor for yeah. me. I don't it's, think it's that's, just that's a that's. Because the emotional connection is still there and the understanding is still there. So I feel like I can understand where you're not happy with the style and the structure, but I don't think it hurts the theme or arc at all. At all. I, it's just, it's just, were also, for me, you know, listening I, to it, it was, it was kind of like, I felt like the character got a little too wishy I think this is the minorest of, of points, but I'm going to just indulge you very briefly here and just say that if there was an r- explanation behind that, it's only because in the, pr- in the previous tracks, you have... You have him describing these details as if it was part of a storybook, and then all of a sudden here you're getting the details, the cold, hard facts, as if he kindly dropped, finally dropped the guys. And for that reason, you almost really, you really don't need anything to echo it. You don't need that literary tool. This it broke the fourth wall. These are the deets. <laughs> and, oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> But, I mean, I I feel like that might be, for me, the only reason why this song is being held back as my favorite. Okay, so then... Like, that was... I I wanted to just point that out. Like, that, I think, might be the only reason I can't say this is my favorite song. Okay. I'm going to just point out, then, that this is my only... uh, This is my last point in this track. Is just if I had one issue with it totally, it's only because the way the music fulfills this whole entire thing, it's still much like another snapshot, another static emotion, and that, of course, doesn't lend itself to really developing the musical front, but that's, you know, that's just... That tends to be the things that I want out of of a storyline. But either, either way, this conveys... I, these isolated in, incidents uh, it becomes, pretty well. It does scene work. It does some yeah. fairly solid scene by scene and work. And story here. development. Right. And as Storm was saying, the story gets developed into the idol's fall from grace. Fall from grace, ha- uh, I, the one thing i got to talk about right away is the fun chime bass combo. You have the very high register and the very low register working interestingly together. In yeah, this a, in is a, um, in a very, for, in this probably the most complex, uh, most pleasing musical part of the whole album. What I me. believe you heard here was uh, a vibraphone, and it's a vibra- vibraphone melody, sort of combined with this light tap on the crash cymbal, which made for perhaps the second most or or most artsy, artsy exposition um, 
along with uh, a song for my a song for our grandfathers, which again began with this uh, this scene work here, which I, I'm saying a lot much more literal because it actually puts you in a zone as opposed to just the aura of the track. It's 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 uh, on the nose in a way, but it's a very interesting pair, just this vibraphone with the crash symbol, and I'm kind of eager to see what they do with it. But I don't know. When it comes to the development of this track. They add a few things gradually, and one of them, the bass, so you got the got the low end bass, a really, really low end, like the lower range of what the bass can do, I which is very that. reminiscent of, of slowcore and grunge, and or even the way post rock today would probably borrow from those two things. And there's just there's just much more passion, I think, in the existing tale when you're exploring what else the music can do, and that's the thing. Music up until now has been fairly Static, same zone, 80s synth, we pretty much know what we're playing with, and this steps away so drastically, I was uh, <laughs> getting more intrigued by the moment. Yes, and I think that also supports where this song was trying to go. I mean, also, when he starts singing, his vocals fall into the background of this song, and I think that's intentional, because he's almost at a point of cr- absolute crisis now, and he's losing himself to the scenery, to the background. All right, well, let's just move it through. First you get the heavier guitar that steps in, right? And that, it almost livens it up in the beginning. It's, although maybe that's the wrong word, it, it harshens it up. It yeah. makes it more intense than it originally was. And like I said, it's this sort of, you know, alt, alternative rock, post-rock post rock sound. And then it goes from minor one to the major three, and it's just, it's amazing how how it can do so much more with the previous track just because of the sound bite. Everything is so much heavier, and then finally it culminates in this... Uh, in this particular verse, pardon my reflection, and this is while the guitar is, is filled out here, in, my, in the mirror, at your feet, before you go, please tell me, was it all inside of me? And this is just, it, it's screamo at this moment. Yeah, he's <laughs> actually... It suddenly is, his, every time he talks, it's suddenly like, bah, which is super weird. Yeah. It's just, he, it, you can tell that at this point, the, the build that the last song was creating boiled over at this point. He's lost his grip. He's letting it out. And, and the, the pure, raw emotion of those screamed lines, it's not screamo, I would argue, because it's inflection and punctuation. It's not screamo because he's not screaming the whole song, which is what of most course, screamo is. Of course, I'm this just is the genre. <laughs> this scream is to emphasize the frustration, aggravation, depression, and anger all well, rolled up into one. It's as he actually is starting to see it's reality. It's scary. He's got this wonderfully. I love this album. It's super to me. It's this warm, not uh, it's sort of sepia tones, very nice fuzzies, blah, blah. And then that happens, and I'm like, I don't know if I want to listen to the rest of the song. Like, <laughs> oh. Ugh. It just got it real. It takes you by surprise. Yeah. It's a scary sound. It's not like other... It's it's not like the um, Scandinavian metal where, like, the the bass player will suddenly start screaming. It's not like that. Like, it's harsh. It's yeah. it's freaky. Like, it made me jump because I didn't know it was coming the first time around. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Well, oh. it, it can... <laughs> Please don't it, do that again. <laughs> it sort of shows the darkness he was sort of building up. In, the dark in... inside of him. Yes. She didn't burn it out. This is the actual <laughs> evil. This is my dark it's passenger. Um, but Which it, is a little cliche, but I think appropriate for where this album is going. Well, I want to interject. Of it. Uh, yeah. I want to interject here just to make a little correction here. I, I described the minor one, major three section as being that stanza. That was a mistake. That was the earlier verse, and then it goes into the bridge, which I would consider this a bridge, really, because it sort of steps away. It's certainly yeah. not a chorus, mm-hmm. but it steps away very harshly, and the chord changes are minor two, minor six, and then on the five right before it's about to pivot back to one, so you feel this tension to five like it's about to go to something strongly, and that's where the guitar sort of takes these harmonies and then widens it chromatically, sometimes almost distantly, like dissonantly. It, it, it stretches it out and gets harsher than anything that had appeared on this album up to now. I'm just, just based on tonal structure, yeah. not you know overall volume, which we've already established is pretty harsh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this growl that he's producing is also showing the rawness of his emotions and where he stands. You know, he's in reality now. Like the moon was him fluctuating between to and from, and now this fall from grace is his face planting into reality and having to... And it hurts. Yeah, and he absolutely has to deal with it. He's, yes, he's questioning everything about why they fell apart. Yeah. Is it him? Is it her? Mostly he's just seeing, like, where's his blame? 
Is he the he one wants to there blame? to be a right or wrong, a, a yes or no? He wants an blame. answer yeah. as to why things fell apart, and he just can't find it. So that anger's boiling over. Also, he he talks about it's like the passing of time. Like he's older and he's grave. He's really serious. Well, grave possibly isn't approaching my grave, but grave isn't very serious. Like he's old enough now to start really looking at it. Hello? It's not the it's not the bloom of youth, you know, the the the. Pfft. The summer romance thing. He's, he's got like, a little bit of wisdom behind he's him. He's got some gray hairs. He's thinking about it, and suddenly it's all very. And that's. And, and I, now he wants closure, right? He wants yeah. to know where did it go wrong? Is there anything left? But I like. Can I even? But I like that there's also, again, like a lot of his other songs, no clear right answer. No. There's a vagueness. Like in life, rarely. I mean, there are relationships that have a. F- uh, someone's clearly at fault. Someone clearly did something wrong. But there are also still a ton of relationships that fall apart, and there's not always a defined reason. It's multiple things, or or so many things to name, or just a blurred grouping of things that you can't decipher. It's the clashing of the gray areas. Mostly. And and I love that this song revels, rips apart, and yells at the gray area mm-hmm. because it exists in that place but still is frantically trying to find its grip on black or white, it not hang in this gray. Mm. This is also something... Uh, this track is a very on-the-nose track. If you haven't... If yeah. You'd have to be asleep during the uh, thematic build-up of this record <laughs> to really not get what this track is about at this point. So, you know, there, there's an artistic argument that can be made that the second he, he pulls that, that, uh, that golden line there, the... Um, uh, was it all inside of me there? And it crashes back to one. It's so, it's almost, uh, it, it's not what this album would otherwise have done. It's it's not what you think is, is in place for this record. And yet, when you consider the build-up, it's the perfect moment. It's, I, the, yeah. it's the release that this this character needed. This is the ultimate Ugh. crescendo. It's this this yeah. build that now it's, the, it, now it's the roll into where is it going. Like, this is the high point. This is not necessarily... This was a pre-planned... Skill. This was a pre-planned point for him to reach in the yeah. album. Maybe not so defined that he planned to hit He was hoping here. to work himself up to this release. Yeah, and he did. And I think... Mm-hmm. The, that was control. The, this yeah, is yeah. the most powerful emotional track on the record for me only because of what led up to it. Without those other pieces, it wouldn't be. But in tandem with the entire record... It is so, so thick, emotional, poignant that it's so much more powerful than anything I could have seen before. I wasn't there originally, but I'm definitely there now. This yeah. is the most emotional track. It's just, it's kind of obvious when you oh. put the pieces together. And then also, of course, the way you see the the uh, the obvious solution present itself. Was it all inside of me? He screams it out. It returns to the one chord. He's back where he was, but this time with a, a resolution. I'll leave here in the morning. No, I think she's saying... You believe she's leaving in the I morning? I think she's leaving in the morning. But at the end, he realizes it was all inside of me. Yeah. Or he says it was, anyway. Yeah. He I wants to get out of her way. Yeah. Sorry for the reflection. Um, It was in my head. Yeah. Or I was the... Whatever. I, the I, darkness... I have things I, I have things... Maybe it was the darkness was inside of me. I was projecting it on you, maybe. Maybe the things that were wrong were things wrong with my head. Yeah. Well, well, point is, someone's leaving in the morning, and that's what's leaving. important. I think it's her. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's her. You're it says, right. He says, "Before you go, please tell me." And then, so before I'm you go, at the, right. the band's lyrics. Yeah, those right. are in quotes. He wants her to say, "Please tell me." And then he says, "Was it all inside of me?" I think she's responding. I'll leave here in the morning. Yeah, you're right. I, I'm not right. even. I, I had a brain. That. I'm not even going to answer that question. <laughs> um, but, uh, and when this track wraps up, though, it, shall we segue into it, it, track? So the, the what I really like about that that ultimate crescendo is that then when it goes into track ten, the final track on the record, the credits song, it, it, uh, a dream of you and me, really is a great conclusion track for me because it fits exactly where it was supposed to be. It's a little cliche, but I like that it's cliche because it's still He's doing it on purpose. Yeah, it it, it 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 adds this finality to the record that that really kind of wraps it up. It shows you know where he's going and and where where the ending is. Maybe not the end for him, but just it's resolving this arc that was created. Mm. And it is the acceptance. Mm, the yeah. To some extent. Acceptance. And it's it's he still argues about it. A bit. He's still not he's he's not fixed. No. He's he's not fully there patched up. There are st- not imperfections, scars. Just put it out there. It's he's still damaged goods. 
But he's at he's a better healing. place. He's, yeah. he's, he's starting yeah. to heal. I had a note here, and this was back from when I was really just following this on the music perspective, and uh, I had noted that it had seemed to lose its mysticism at this moment, which I think is, is I don't know, it's kind of an interesting observation that, now that I think about it, because what, he had been in this mystical environment where say, everything that's was definitely over-engrandized. I find himself like, it, standing. The last yeah. song was a crash into reality. This is an existence within it. Yeah. This is him standing on the shoreline going... <gasps> Well, okay. now I stick with the music that uh, because it lost its mysticism, it wasn't really as entrancing to me. It was a little bit duller of a track, and I, it could be it's far from my favorite track in this record, right? But well, it is an appropriate close, and we all agree mm -hmm. with that. Yeah, it does a lot to bring you back to reality, yep. yeah, and which was the goal of the last two tracks for sure. Um, and he's he's still a little jaded, he's still a little yeah. vindictive. But, All that glitters yeah. is gold. Don't believe what you've been told. People lie, people love, people go. But beauty lies in every soul. So yeah, it's like he's after a all this angst, angsty, he comes back with a moral. <laughs> yeah, we're taking yeah, morals like, from this guy you know because of it experience. Happens. Yeah, it it happened. Everybody it, it was what it was. He says everybody's a jerk. No, but there's still good in people. People do what people do, and this is some things that people do, and it's not yeah. good or bad, it just is. It's, it is what it is, it is. yeah. <laughs> Let's not be too complacent here. <laughs> well, no, he's saying everything is real. All that glitters is gold, so there is no fool's gold. It's all real, but don't believe what you've been told. It's all real and none well, of Beauty it is. lies in every soul. Um, it's pretty much there's someone for everybody. There's something beautiful. I, I, um, someone out I was there saying for earlier, everybody. when we were talking before we started recording, um, the, the book, The Things They Carried, which is a collection of war stories about uh, Vietnam. Oh, yeah. There's a specific story called How to Tell a True War Story. And he talks about um, sometimes you, you go through something horrific or something really damaging to you, and the only way to get it out, to purge that, to heal, is to keep talking about it over and over and over again. And he said, you know what? It doesn't matter if the story I'm telling you is true. It doesn't matter if it happened. Maybe it did happen. Maybe it didn't happen. Every single story I tell you is both an absolute truth and a total lie, and that's fine. And this is, everything here is gold. It's all beautiful. It's all beautiful, and none of it is. You know, people love, people lie. Nothing I told you is true, and everything I told you is true, but you know what? It's okay. And at the very, very end, I asked myself for pieces, and I asked, I wanted to have a resolution in this. And that, but I found a piece of myself. I got something back. I'm starting to heal. And that line wraps around cyclically to the beginning where he also has a line about peace mm. and it's in a similar context he had been asking for peace and now he has found a, a peace. piece of himself looking out at the sea going okay yeah well the sort of bemused like staring past you not really at you manner of telling this record kind of seems to imply that the record of course is more for him not for you not for us the listeners i mean and that would almost make it seem like a little bit distant. But at the same time, it's important because often, as listeners, we find reflectiveness. We find situations, scenarios that, that reflect to our own experiences. And that can be very, uh, I think, uplifting for, for many people, or at least very comforting. Yeah. And I mean, the fact that they see something that may have echoed, because of, for sure, this is not an... This is not such an isolated incident that it isn't relatable. In many ways, he's... he's taking a it's a broad take on relationships and the way many relationships go this is just the, the way two different people often will clash but but that broadness is a great way to bring people in because exactly so that's what I'm having saying, a it, very it specific that, that, yeah, that theory yeah because the, having a specific narrative can leave a lot of people to fall to the wayside but having this broad Speaking more to how he feels instead of what is, what happened, what the facts are, allows people to get wrapped up in the story that he's weaving here. And it's such a strong story. Right. Um, you and, can relate to people telling lies or falling in love or leaving. And, and beauty. And, and, and what I that's, why, that's why books are sold. Right, yeah. yeah. And what that's I really like literature. Is, is, is I think we yeah. came to the conclusion that it doesn't matter when this is. When has no relevance. It's all about his perspective, regardless of when each track is. And especially considering the emotional arc that's built, once you hit 9 and 10, it, 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 it really wraps everything else up together. It can feel a little scattered before that, but it's supposed to because it's fanciful. Because there's that fey element. And it's really designed to drive into the finale, which the last two songs clearly are. 
We take a lot of things from relationships. Some survive till death, some last in the short term, and this is just a presentation of a few of those things. I'm a person who firmly believes that I would not be the person I am today if not for the failures and successes of my past We're in relationships. It just prepares me for the next right thing. There you are. So, um, I think this is a good pretty much our only recourse well, as, as people who live just one life and it's you yeah. know, kind of linear. You don't well, have, you can accept it. Like, or you can ignore or it. You can, you can, you can, you know, do this wandering thing or you can do what he does where he finds himself just staring at and being like, okay. Mm-hmm. You can accept it. You, you can, can accept Or you can lament it. And it seems like for much of this record, totally trying miserable. to, trying to control it. Yeah. yeah. Which you cannot do. Yeah. And we're wrapping up here. I'll start. Okay. Unless you want to start, Storm, because you are on a roll. Um, No, I'll let you take this one. I'll jump in after. It's the stages of grief in a relationship. That's what it kind of comes down to. It's him working through the breakup. And it is so nonspecific that it's easily relatable to anybody's situation, but has enough texture, imagery in the vocals and the lyrics that... You can see the specific pictures he's painting, even if you're interpreting it yourself. That is a beautiful way to create a piece of work here. It's I, I enjoyed the album throughout, and that's not something we've had for a while. I've liked a lot of songs from albums, but this is one that, that I can really say front to end I, I really was into. Um, the progression, not just, not musically... But thematically is so powerful and great use of theme work for instruments to people. Like we said, the the, the fey music, the magical music, the light airy stuff is the female presence while the male presence is that earthy bass tones. Uh, it's, it's a great uh, album when you have clearly defined characters coming in and out of your plot. And you can readily accept uh, accept them for what they're presenting. the The biggest issue I have with this album is that it it's so simple musically. I felt like there was so much more that could be done with the melodies, with the harmonies. I, I I'm that's where I really think it's lacking. Everything else, though, is just so solid. The theme is amazing. The arc is there, but it's that musical part that's keeping it from being a top-tier album. I wanted to be engaged with more than just his vocals. I wanted the whole package. Because the most engaging item is his vocal work, and that's true throughout the entire album. There's nothing else for me to latch on to as, as the primary focus. Well, I have a great character, but I, I want a little a little more maybe with the setting work that the music can do that said it's not knocking it down that much this is a a solid it's higher than a 4.5 it's a beautiful piece of art so I'm going to put it because I'm going to get nitpicky like uh, Steve taught me how to do it Uh, it's a solid 4 a solid 4.7 it is a, a really really amazing work it's just it's lacking that one little element to really put it to the best of what it can do okay um i mean if you've been listening since episode one it's no secret that i tend to lend myself to emotional music you Um, like the you like the feels i like the feels it feels are feels are good those are very good um those are nice there has not been a tighter emotional arc that we've heard like this, this album. We've talked about a lot of tight arcs, but emotionally, this is the tightest emotional relationship arc we've ever seen. I mean, it really, it really is beautifully weaved together. But the best part is the uncertainty in the beginning is relevant to the content, and that ninth track, that crescendo, solidifies the whole record. Before that, you're kind of not sure where you're going. You're wondering. You're just as lost as he is. But then that that moment, that moment when you come crashing back to Earth, you go with him in the arc of this record. Um, We've many a times bumped records up in spite of its flaws based on strengths that supersede. I cannot think of any album we've ever done 
that has an emotional arc as strong as this one. There might be. I could I could stand corrected or sit corrected since we sit when we record. <laughs> paper chase. Oh, paper chase. But okay, this is that one. Is, this is not as uh, paper chase was not nearly as pleasant. Yes. Even though this is a sad, sad story. But but it was paper chase was just disturbing and but, solid. This but, is emotional and solid. And I enjoyed every second of it. There are songs like I said, doves. I don't really remember as well as the other tracks, but that's really the only one. Every other track I remember in most detail. Um, I just. I got I'm I got absorbed into this record. Um, I know that you're saying that there are imperfections that knock this down from being that next level album, but I I mean it's already I've already said before I don't feel an album has to be flawless to be perfect in my eyes to be that next step musically. And as far as emotional arcs go, this is what albums live to be. If you want to create an album with a narrative that's not so specific that you lose your audience. This is what you build. You can build a, a specific narrative and still bring a lot with you and still open yourself up to people. But this is a beautiful m- mesh of non-specific and specific to really take you on an emotional ride that that I haven't seen before. So I'm giving this album what I would be expected to because it's what I feel. This album's a five. And it's a five because of that arc. Musically... I'm not as affected as John was, and I'm assuming Steve will be. Um, though I could be wrong. Let's not cast aspersions. <laughs> Good word. Nice word. I like that word. But this is a five for me. It's this is this isn't the running competing with St. Vincent, which is the only other five I've given this year, because of this arc. I'm so connected to this album, and it so fits within my heart because I know exactly what he's going through that I couldn't not put it there because I've put it other, put other albums there for less. So... This one's a five. I think that what they did is brilliant. I know nothing of their catalog. This is the only album of theirs I've heard. But now I'm so excited tomorrow at work on Spotify to go through the rest of their records. Because if they even achieve... And they do have several. If they achieve you have stuff to explore. even two-thirds of this in every record, I will be blown away. And they will have earned a lifelong fan, though they have already. So that's where I sit with this record. Okay, well, I'm going to start... Not by hammering the theme to death, because it's clearly been the focus of pretty much all of our discussions today. We, we've we talked about theme, sometimes uh, sometimes leaving certain little things out, because that was the most interesting thing to look at in the time. And it is true that very often that one thing, especially if it's important enough, or if it's contributing enough to the evolution of music or of the art form therein, then it can kind of combat those other things. But over to music. Considering we talked about feels, you said you're all about the feels. <laughs> I'm about the feels too. We all are about the feels, although we have this, this idea that we're, we're, we're more about certain things than, the, than other things. And I say that I'm more about the music, but only because certain developments of music often give me the stronger feels. <laughs> Can we just sing Yeah, this? I'm really Please tired warn. of using this. <laughs> I like how... And I'm using, saying it so straightly, too. Yes. That's what makes I it funny. I have feels. I have the feels. And that is true. I, I mean, Steve's getting very emotional. <laughs> it's okay, this Dana. This is me getting emotional. Someday you'll be a real boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, that was Prince Johnny. All right. But here's the thing. I do get quite a bit from this album out of from the, the music itself. And it, very often it can do that with the, the simple pop structures that it began with. We have um, we have the synth, which is there almost throughout. It's kind of the eternal setting, even though it changes only in moments and in the most appropriate moments to pull away when all of a sudden we're not in storybook land anymore and things have gotten real. I like to see that, and I like to see the music accommodate itself so closely to the story. So when you have this interplay back and forth, I gotta say that's one of the strongest things uh, music can do, and I'm not about to say that um, that you can't do a lot with a little. Especially the vocals themselves, I'm inclined to think, are a lot. Even though the little they're in is the, is the vocal range. It doesn't go very high, it doesn't go very low, but the inflection is 
is constrained and almost muted, kind of suppressed at times, because it can't, it, it, it shouldn't lash out in the ways that, that you might expect it to at certain moments, because he's constantly trying to keep himself in line, constantly trying to keep himself believing the story and, and not lashing out the way he eventually does in Fall from Grace. And that's the moment when all of a sudden that is placed in context. All this sort of amounts to an album that you really have to think about. It's not the album that presents itself clearly on a first listen, because otherwise you might get my initial impression of this album, which is that, okay, it's clearly a breakup album, as it were, that's too light, and it's clearly a pop album, but that's too light. Both of those things, all of these things, are intertwined as one cohesive tale. The only thing that I wish for is that it was more developmental. That's basically the thing that, that pushes songs along for me and takes me to the next level. That's the only thing that this, uh, that this entire record is lacking. That brings it down almost exactly where uh, St. Vincent was, which was a case where I preferred more of a cohesive storyline. 4.8. Oh. Galatea. Ha! You guys actually analyzed this far more than I did. Because um, when I listened to it, I was like, oh, this is an album that makes me feel good inside. Fuzzies. Well, like, we, we've made it our job to No, be... I know, but I mean, I it, normally I listen to music not just because, like, it sounds nice, but, like, this one I just sort of didn't, prior to this, I just sort of had nice nostalgic feels about it, because it was like, the kid that I was really fond of, and isn't that the other thing, and, like, <sighs> um, so looking at it as a bigger picture album, I don't actually think I own other music that is that solid. Like, as a story. Except for maybe, like, one or two, like, rock operas. Like, honestly, I, like, I don't think I listen to music that that's cohesive. Um, I like it. It puts me in a... For me, this album is... Uh, puts me into, like, several distinct moments in my personal history that I have come to terms with and have embraced as, like, high points in personal growth and development. And to be able to do that to me is not something I do often. Um, so its ability to do that is practically magical. To sit there and go, whoa. Like, I remember that day. I remember sitting on my bed and staring at my ceiling and feeling these things and thinking about these things. Um, it's, it's like a really good book that sort of tells you that what you're going through is okay or, like, a beautiful poem that, like, touches you right right on that like just pokes you in that right little part of your heart and that's really hard to do um to find uh musicians who are also such lyricists um who can write actual poetry of this caliber so um i will give it above a 4.5 i don't really know if i should call it a five because I don't know if I should quest for the perfect album. Uh, that's the way I acted at the very beginning. <laughs> um, the first time I gave a 4.9, I added a little addendum, and I said, uh, well, I leave the five for my eternal search for something greater um, than art. <laughs> but the fact that it's golden in my head, I think I will probably give it that five, just because it's just so pristine lyrically and emotionally and developmentally writing-wise. Because I'm, I'm a words person, so the words are just gah. <laughs> I like words, too. I just can't use them. <laughs> oh, I'm good at using them. I can but, write them. I but just, I think yeah. I will give it that five just for that beautiful golden sound. Golden sound, warm tone, makes me feel wonderful like a blanket, and it's just written so nicely. Which is a perfectly reasonable way to look at it. I mean, re ultimately, it's what it does for you. I mean, and that's where we... The simplest way we're all rating is where in our heart of hearts it, we feel it fits. Mm. So, so that is my thought. Um, it's definitely the most cohesive. I think I agree with your assessment on that, Matt. That is the most cohesive album that we've had, um, alongside maybe just two others for me. I, it's very, it's a very small but it's list definitely within because the genre. there's very few albums that just don't miss a beat throughout. He knew exactly what he's doing, and he knew how to tell his story in the most impactful of ways, um, dipping in and out whether chronology matters at moments or not. Yeah. That's a very powerful thing. I respect the long form art, which is why it's ironic. Ironic that 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 little point two takeaway for me was only because of the short term. In other words, the track itself didn't go out into this long thing, but yet they could do it over the course of 45 minutes. Well, I think yeah. I think for me, the only albums that, as cohesive units, are in this same realm are the ones without words. Yeah. Like Scale, mm. uh, 
Cigarros. Yeah. Well. Uh, Boards of Canada, like the ones without the words, are the ones that seem to be the most put well. Because you're creating right. your own, they have nothing to fall back on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that that it's it's this is the only verbal album. I think I actually am putting up in that echelon. It's so, lovely. So yes. th- thank you, Galatea, <laughs> for bringing this because you've brought yeah. us an album that will definitely come up again on our year in review at the end Yay! of the year for sure. So yeah. well yeah. done. Um, It'll be a new category. <laughs> I'm I'm grateful. As someone who's a friend of mine and whose art I'm truly fascinated by and enjoy a lot, <laughs> that you're actually on the podcast and we can talk to you about it. Um, the, the the place I wanted to really start with it is, I mean, I, I'm trying to avoid cheesy questions that I'm sure you get a thousand times. But, you know, I asked you a little bit about how you got started in burlesque, and I know around the whereabouts, I know you have a, a, um, an origin in improv, mm. which I imagine is where some of this art had come from. Uh, No. Actually, <laughs> they're very independent. Uh, we got the super, obvious question wrong. <laughs> super independent, actually. Um, I did do improv for three years of college, um, and that was really, really important. But that taught me how to move, and that told me how to be quick on my verbal feet, um, and how to interpersonal comedy. But the statuing, um, the statuing entirely came from a very, very dear friend of mine who. I can only assume she started doing it because of Amanda Palmer from the Dresden Dolls. That is my assumption because when I met her, she was like a mini me Amanda Palmer. Um, kind of this like pixie dream girl of wonderment and we became best friends and she did living statue stuff and she'd been doing it for years and I was so fascinated because the first time I met her, I went to an improv show and she was statuing in the lobby as a Victorian lady. It was, I thought it was, it was, a, it was a, it was one of the big theaters at UConn. So I thought it was actually an art display. I thought it was a mannequin. With a, it was so pristine. It was this white fluffy gown, this Victorian lady's gown with a, pa- a parasol and gloves and things. And I didn't know it was real until like a year later. And someone's like, oh, that was her. I was like, oh. um, and she got me into it and she promised to teach me. And, um, so she taught me her ways. Um, so I, I just learned it directly from her, and she was never into improv, but... So is it a straight master and apprentice type no, situation? No, she more told me about it. I watched her. Um, I did a little bit of reading, um, and then I kind of just pulled it out of my own head, really. I saw what she had done. I, I figured I had ideas of what I wanted to do, and a lot of the way I, the way I pose, the way I carry myself, the way... Um, each of the individual characters that I statue as behave, that's all just sort of boiling out of my head. Um, it's just something I have I create as I go. Well, the, the first few times, like, because being a living statue is not the realm of what people, like, re- think about. No. It's, it's a very unique profession. It really is. It would have never... Never it's, thought about it if I hadn't met her. Exactly. Honestly. Like, what was going through your head the first few times you did this? Oh God! Oh God! Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> um, Just I, don't mess up! Don't mess up! Don't mess so up! So the very, 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 very first few times I did it, I was still at UConn for college, and it was something I wanted to try. I really liked the idea of it, and I was like, I'm going to be so great, and I was using terrible makeup, and I looked like a fright, and I did it as like a a promotional stunt for my improv troupe. I had not nearly enough white paint, or not, not enough white clothes. I had little white signs that like advertised our show, and I went to the student union and I stood there and I scared the piss off of a bunch of bros and people thought it was well. They said, "Oh, we want to have some human statues promoting our show." I thought they meant living statues. They met improv improvisers in our club, uh, chasing each other in stillness down the hallway. So I totally mistranslated, and then I did it as a fundraiser for one of my favorite charities, and that was when I was like this is really fun. And then I needed to get out of Connecticut and I realized for at least for a little while I could, I could do it as a, a job, like as a street performance thing. Um, and that's when it sort of became, became, it really, it's, it was not an obsession, but it became who I defined myself as for a really long time. And that was when I realized like, wow, I can totally do it. Once I got the makeup right, once I had a proper costume, once I got to, look people in the eye and ask them for money without saying anything, it became a real art. 
Um, because before it was just a stupid publicity stunt and it was me asking for money for a charity and this was like, this is my art. I'm actually making art. I'm actually trying to make a living. I'm actually doing something in New York City. Oh God, I'm in Manhattan. I'm a artist on the street. Holy crap. Well, uh, do you have any stories about how you chose your, your costume, the persona you're projecting? Yes, the very first one I did, um, I went to my closet and I said, oh, I have that white dress. And that white dress cost me $5 in the thrift shop, and I don't have any money. I'm basically running away from home in the middle of the night. I will take this dress, I'll buy a white pair of sandals, I'll buy a white wig at a costume shop and some clown makeup, and uh, it's good enough for me. And then it turned out people really liked her. Um, <laughs> it's such a simplistic, it's almost a shift dress. It's this very, very simple, simple, simple thing, and people responded to the simplistic beauty of it. Um, I've expanded since then. I have other costumes, but that's my basic summer thing um and that was just i i had it in my closet on a fluke because i thought it was pretty and i'd bought it to please myself and then i realized i could use it as a costume um i want to link this to while we're talking about the um street performance to your blog website that i think is brilliantly titled <laughs> because even though i know you'll never shut up because we hang out a lot and you talk a lot <laughs> oh gee um you you titled it The Statue Speaks, and it's this idea that you're a person who lives in stillness and silence, but you still have something to say. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And very recently, within the last, I think it was year or so... It was in the last year. You had a, a not great experience uh, with with people while you were statuing. And I was going to ask this. How do you deal with people who are jerks? Terrible. Um, so, for context, overall my experience has been positive. Um... Bear in mind, I've been doing this for three years, and for two of those years, this is my sole form of income. So, like, three to five times a week doing this. So nothing happened, mostly. But every once in a while, you get... <sighs> oh, it's the uncanny valley thing. People don't know what you are, because it is such an uncommon form of art, right? So you're dealing with a, a demographic of people who don't really go to museums. They don't study art. Um, they don't have never heard of this art form. And you're standing there covered in white paint, and you kind of look like Lieutenant Commander Data from Star Trek, but creepier. Because <laughs> you're not moving, but your eyes are glittering. What I got called. <laughs> and you scare them. And they get really, really scared in that moment, because it's just wrong, somehow. It doesn't look right. And so they get scared, and then they get angry. Because you respond to you, fear with you anger. You respond to yeah. fear. I'm suddenly scared, and now I'm angry that I'm scared, because I don't know what I'm scared of. And I, as the physical manifestation of this anger fear, and in a passive role, am now the... the I am the thing that you take it out on. So I've gotten everything from um, people saying standing in front of me and having horribly rude conversations about what they'd like whether or not I'm I'm fuckable <laughs> to uh, just bluntly like literally two feet away from me just this very frank oh I don't know would you take her home because I might I mean to people speculating on my gender commenting on the size of my Adam's apple is that what sex am I can you tell well it's New York honey you don't really know to 55 year old men making an ass of themselves trying to get me to break character to people threatening to beat me up, to uh, physically assault me, to people uh, fighting with the cops about whether or not this is an art form, if I even have the right to be there at all, to getting chased down the street, uh, getting to my apartment like 10 feet ahead of the person chasing me, and when I slam the door, they start smashing on the door trying to get in after me. Like, big gamut of things, from mild, mild street harassment to getting punched in the face uh, two Thanksgivings ago. So how do I deal with it? Um, I didn't used to. I used to have a totally passive role, and I'd just wait and hope to God that they would go away. And then I got groped, and then some guy lifted my dress, and I started freaking out. And those, bo those, bo those incidents both happened in one day, and both times I punched the respective men in the faces, started screaming like a banshee, and basically made as big of a wail in the subway as I could. Um, and I got a lot of public shaming on my side. Because if you start screaming to the surrounding 100 people that that man just reached out and groped you, and you're pointing at him, and you're screaming at him, and he's trying to defend himself, everyone can't, no one can ignore it at that point. It's not like something that happens in a subway car and everyone just sort of goes into the newspapers. Like, they can't avoid it. To, uh, I've gotten the police involved. Um, I've learned in the last two years to 
when to break character and like preemptively cut that off and tell people you have to go I don't have time for this you cannot play pitch the penny in my tip jar um, you can't talk to me like that I will get you arrested right now if you don't leave. Do you see that man over there? I hired him as my muscle today. You know, I've learned to break character, deal with them, and I've, in the last year, I've actually started hiring bodyguards to come with me just because the physical unsafety that I currently feel. Um, and I'm more painfully aware of the street harassment, so when it happens, it really hits me. I get, like, PTSD about it, kind of. It's kind of a shame that you have to deal with that uh, rather diverse cross-section of humanity that and with, many would probably never even realize And exists. it sounds like it's this awful, awful career and everyone's terrible, and it's not. Most of the time what I get is this wonderful, wonderful feedback from all all ages and genders and I'm assuming a lot races. of children Children either that. love me or are terrified of me. Well, the, yeah, there's... You... Most little girls think I'm the prettiest darn thing they've ever seen. And you get little girls who are like, she's like a princess. You get little boys who are so shy because I'm so pretty that they can't even look at me. And they're like sidling over, like covering their eyes, like dropping a, dropping a dollar and then scooting back behind their moms. And then I like <laughs> wave my finger at them and they blush bright red and like dart <laughs> off. And then there's the kids that think you were actually a statue. Scary. And it's happened once or twice and, yeah. and they like scream like, little girls because they are <laughs> actually little girls um some of them are really really afraid of me and but i've had so many wonderfully positive experiences you get like fellow artists who come up to me and they're like wow i love what you're doing i don't even know what it is and photographers who want to work with me and um hipsters who come up to me and compose a poem in my ear people giving me roses arbitrarily coming up to me and handing me a red rose um women coming up to me in tears because it's just so darn beautiful and wow um uh lots of guys asking me out <laughs> i've gotten I, the, one of the first weeks i was statuing some wonderful guy came up to talk to me and eventually dropped his his number in my my jar and we ended up having a really nice date it was like this sort of romantic comedy like oh the guy who couldn't get me out of his head so he went off and bought a pad and a pen from the local Duane Reed and came back <laughs> um <laughs> it's such a gamut like it I, I recently tend to focus so much on the negative um and I write about the negative because that's what raises dialogue but there's a lot of positive too well, I only have one more negative question then we'll move on to the positive things <laughs> um you you mentioned the police uh, got involved uh, were you accused of loitering um so I've had three hmm, I've had about five police run-ins at this point um no <laughs> three serious incidents plus some asides sometimes I think they're about to give me a hard time and they're just like hey you how's it going Jai John, do you think we should uh, carry this thing out of the way? Doop -a doo and that's fun. And then I realized like they're they're kidding me, and it's like, um, there was one cop at Atlantic Pacific, uh, two weeks in a row, really had it out for me. He was convinced I wasn't doing art. Um, he was gonna give me a ticket, and I was like, you can't do that because I know my rights. And then the MTA rules of conduct specifically allow for performance art and the acceptance of donations. And he was like, well, you're vending. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm definitely not vending. <laughs> this is not for sale. This is not for sale. Don't even. <laughs> um, and he's like, well, I'll find something else. And I ended up uh, making such a, st I called his precinct. <laughs> well, when I it... spoke to his captain. And that was really bad because he, he took away a whole week's worth of income for me. He's like, I'll be waiting for you. Don't you dare come back, blah, blah. And then the third incident I had was also at Atlantic Pacific. And that was after I got punched in the face. And I had, there were two private plainclothes detectives and, um, like 10 or 12 officers turned the whole station upside down trying to find the kid. They like blanketed the place. They called the EMTs cause they thought I had a concussion. They spent the next month canvassing the place. Um, the detectives actually rode home with me on the subway, offered to walk me to my front door, uh, following subsequent weeks they would come up to me and be like hey so we're going to be positioned at these places around the station should you need us you know so mostly it's been positive or like we hate to ask you to leave but there's like a rally upstairs and like 50,000 people are going to come down so come back tomorrow We're real sorry so yes police interactions but I think on the whole they just kind of once they find out that you pay taxes, you pay self-employment tax, they really like you a lot more. Because a lot of them don't know and they see you as like a freeloader. And you're like, no, I pay my taxes. I'm a good citizen. They're like, oh, 
okay. <laughs> so when it involves the MTA, do you are you sort of through a program? No, the um, there is a program in the MTA called M U N Y Music Under New York, right. which is an audition based MTA sponsored program, and so that is audition based. And if you get into Muni, what that means literally is only that you get a banner. You're allowed to sell your music. You can have more amplification. And you get reserved spots at primo real estate locations inside the subway. I'm an I'm a I'm a freelancer, so I have not auditioned for them because I'm not music, and I refuse to be like the horrible mimes who got in and use like subsonic weird noises. <laughs> You've probably seen those of the black guys with the black morph suits with the white masks, and they move real slow to like ambient music. Um, and I didn't think I'd fit with them, so I kind of have to work around them, work around their slots and spots. But I've actually statued in their spots, and I don't make nearly as much money as my own nooks and crannies, so I kind of just work around them, and most of the conversation is usually, well, you don't have a, a performing permit. I'm like, there is no such thing. And they're like, well, that other guy has a banner and a permit. I'm like, it's not a permit. All it is is he gets to perform in a particular spot. So I am not associated with anyone. Slight but preferential treatment. Ah! Uh, well, they think it is, but there's a lot of stations that they perform at that I cannot. Oh, okay. Um because of where they are located, how safe those places are, what time of night it is. Mm-hmm. You, I would not be caught dead riding the subway alone at night in statue paint, ever. Um, just because the the harassment stuff is just too great a threat. Um, well, I, mean, I imagine you're comfortable in the said nooks and crannies, and it's probably, you probably made a name for yourself there if you have a people, frequent crowd. People recognize me. When I perform at Atlantic Pacific, if I haven't been there in a while, people will be like, I haven't seen you in so long. It's so great to see you. Here's a dollar. Um, I'm like the, the local color, as it were, even though I'm all white. But <laughs> and they're, not really, they're not really crannies. It's more just places that are not reserved by Muni. Gotcha. So. Oh going on you also now do burlesque yes i do so you were a little self-deprecating about your act what oh no it's not self-deprecating it's fine. oh no it's it's both <laughs> well, I, I don't think it should be so what is, what is the what act is, what is the act so the Walk us through it. uh so the act i debuted um after much thought and fear of cliche um it's the statue of liberty which I have very mixed feelings about because there are those guys in Times Square who pretend to be the Statue of Liberty and they wave flags and charge money. Uh, I have maintained that they're not real statues. So I have this weird, I don't know if I want to portray the Statue of Liberty, but I sucked it up. And so she's basically, the Star Spangled Banner starts playing and she's late for work. She has missed her cue. And the the Star Spangled Banner is playing and she's not even there. And she comes rushing out and she's like, oh crap, oh crap, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. But I, I can't sit, think of, of a more New York theme. Right. There's, <laughs> but I, then she's so bored. She has to stand through the entire Star Spangled Banner, and all she wants to do is crack gum, be done, yawn. She's probably going to scratch her butt. Like, she's so bored. And when it ends, it's finally time to go clubbing, and she pulls a flask out is- of her tablet and rips off her gown, and underneath she is wearing club wear. And she is going to get wasted, and she's a woo girl. This is the first time I'm hearing this. I think it's a brilliant theme. Yeah. I think and the it's, Statue of Liberty is insanely New York. Where's, it's, where's the self deprecating? What's oh, wrong? Nothing's wrong. It's just a very stupid idea. And no, by it's stupid, not. I it's... mean. Uh, stupid is a burlesque term that means that is the dumbest, most brilliant thing I've ever heard. Yeah, stupid. When, you, when I say stupid, I mean we think of traditional burlesque involving fan dances. And I know two women, one does a fan dance to a, a, a repeating car alarm, <laughs> and the other one does a fan dance with actual electric fans. Those are stupid. They're genius, but they're stupid. And so when I say it's a stupid idea, it's just like, the Statue of Liberty is a woo girl? Huh. <laughs> it really works brilliantly. It's cheeky. And, and it's not serious. I'm, you're never going to catch me covered in rhinestones doing classical numbers with big feather fans and evening gowns. Like, I'm just too dumb. I, I'm too gaudy. I'm too awkward. I can't be that graceful swan thing. I'd rather do something silly and cheeky and say something weird, wacky. I think my favorite part about the act is that the song that Star Spangled Banner goes into is Let's Get This Party Started uh, Get This Party Started by Pink, yeah. which I think is perfectly chosen. Pink is obnoxious. She knows that she's a little awkward, and she's like, you know what? It's, yeah, that's me, exactly. 
raspberries to you. Which is what I like about it. Well, I can think of only, only one specific question that I would really have to ask you about the um, about the process of the art, and that is just the breathing process. How do you control that? I just breathe. You just breathe. I have never tried to not breathe. I don't assume that that is. The I need people to know that I'm human because okay. if they think I'm a mannequin, that that can go so awkward. unsafe so yeah. fast. And that's why I blink I at people. That's why I I whip my eyes around to like look at people. I look people in the eye. I will quirk an eyebrow. I'm very careful to breathe. I don't ever move. I move significantly less than any other art model or living statue I've met. But I am very careful to make sure that I breathe and I never wear sunglasses because I need people to know that there's a person in here mm. because otherwise I'm going to get groped, I'm going to get hit, I'm going to have someone spit in my tip jar, like any any number of things and I need them to be aware that it's not um, okay. a mannequin. Yeah. It needs to be a person. So I just breathe. It's, I go into kind of a zen state where I kind of sit there and people watch. And it's not meditative, but it's just suddenly it's been three hours and it doesn't mm. feel like three hours. So it's relaxed breathing, but I have very slow breaths anyway. So I think it, it's just, I'm just breathing gently. <laughs> yeah. I'm that guy in the room who occasionally goes like, <gasps> I forget to breathe. So it's very like, awkward when I have would, to know. sneeze. I kind of like try to time it in between trains so no one's nearby. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I, I just got this mental image of you going... Like, looking back and forth and then sneezing. That's basically what happens. And then there's always some poor soul who walks by and the snatch just goes, Ah, oh, shoo! And they're just like, what? <laughs> um, Can't help it. <laughs> um, I, I truly am really grateful that you came on the podcast. I've known you for a long time and it's kind of fun to actually hear you talk always. <laughs> I mean, I saw you perform before I did know you and you had this beautiful silent grace and to know that you're a silly, dorky, ridiculous person also... Well, my I always cost. say I'm my really cost. I'm really graceful and pretty, and then I open my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it's it's really been a pleasure having you, and thank you for bringing this album, which I truly yeah, enjoy. Yeah, absolute shout out to Henry and his dad. I would not have even listened to this otherwise. Um, I'm actually going to go buy this for myself on vinyl because it's worth listening to. <laughs> That's a killer breakup album. So it's thank so you with good the on question vinyl. mark. <laughs> You're <laughs> welcome. It's so good on vinyl though. Like it's actually better than listening to it in the digital. I say that rarely. Um, so I'm really excited to go buy it myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, and but yeah, it's been a, it's been a pleasure having you on. Getting to know more about you, even knowing you as well as I do, finding out more here on the podcast is great. And I hope you'll come back at some point, maybe next year, and bring us another album. Oh God, <laughs> the pressure. <laughs> um, before we we close and wrap up, um, I guess we'll go to Steve for our spam. Ah, uh, yes, the spam of the week. Spam, spam, spam. So spam. glad that you remembered. The spam of the week. The mess and the stink were not worth the trouble or the savings. They were very intelligent and liked to be clean, so they should pick it up quickly. Are the ones who those weird pets that only the strange and lonely have aren't... Oh. <laughs> By Crimson Chilla. Wait, it just ends like that? Reboot them. Yeah, no, it didn't even finish the word aren't. Aren't. <laughs> cut off. We have aren't. You, did, did you just copy and paste it wrong? Oh, no, I am diligent. <laughs> of course you are. I'm diligent with our... With our spam. With our pointless spam, yeah. With our pointless... Eh, nothing is pointless. I, I'm No bashing anymore. You no self-deprecation. You will find out someday that all sweet. of this is just some some surrealist dipping into, like, Dadaism or something. It's just, like, some surrealist hipster is sending out really interesting I, spam. I <laughs> like... Is this the new level of Campbell suit? paintings were getting? It totally is. The new Andy Warhol. Well, it's like the guys I used to know in Williamsburg who would send uh, postcards to strangers. Ooh. This guy. <laughs> or it could be I don't just doubt some random out there person. trying to top Andy Warhol. It might be some Philly random issues. person in, like, you know, Russia whose internet just cut out. <laughs> Someone is desperately seeking their Nigerian princess. I also like the idea, though, that <laughs> when we had... <laughs> a ton of views on our episode that we reviewed Jack White, people who had not heard the show before, hears that spam at the end of that interview and go, what the hell are they doing? Or get a good laugh out of it. I like this idea of throwing people off. It's fun. For us, at least, and hopefully for everybody else. Well, then I think we One should start compiled. starting with spam. Like having an argument with them? No, just start with Steve reading a spam comment. That wouldn't be the strangest thing, but I don't really? know. Really? You want to become the artsy-fartsy type, really? <laughs> Dude, we're just reaching a whole new level here. Stop. Stop. Just we're, stop. No. I already hate this idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So the next <laughs> album pick, though it's been a while, is actually my pick. And I decided that it's time. I've mentioned metal on the podcast before and taken us in the direction of it. But I've decided it's time we dive in head first. Judas Priest has a brand new record out. The Rob Halford-led oh. band of amazing heavy metal. Um, they released an album called Redeemer of Souls. Um, I have not heard it. I don't really know anything about it. I heard their last record, which I really liked, um, which I think came out three or four years ago, though I could be wrong. I want to do this one. Um, I don't have... A, I like Judas Priest. They're greatest hits band for me, as I say. I know all the big singles, and I like a few of their albums. But this one, I want to give it a shot. Let's see, let's see what they've got. I mean... Rob Halford's got some of the strongest vocals you'll ever hear, but let's see what the music has to say. Keep us on our toes, as always, Matt. Yep, Thank that's you. me. Didn't do you, do you miss when I was boring and predictable? Because this is your fault. Ooh, drama, 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 drama. No, it's just pointing out that Steve made gonna, me grow I, as a person. I want to make you a drama llama. Ah, stay, stay a drama llama. Like stay pointedly llama. silent. Yes, well, by saying that, you're not. Um, I stayed <laughs> silent. <laughs> Were you sitting um, on your hands? Was that it? <laughs> no, they're folded, though. <gasps> He's good. Um, I, of course, so want to say thank you for listening. Um, please check out our Facebook page, our Twitter page. We have a Tumblr that we post on pretty regularly. Um, Once again, look at our new segment. Um, we also have a YouTube page where we are about halfway through putting up the backlog of this current podcast, and we already have the new podcast's first episode on there, as well as live performances of bands like The Wasties, Painless Parker, and Wall Street players who have all been guests on the show. Um, email us questions, comments, post them on the site, suggest an album. Preferably within the last couple of years, we're trying to stay current, but if you f your fancy is to really request something classic, give a reason. Let us know. Why? We're also putting up the episodes backwards, so don't start them, because in a couple days you won't have started it. <laughs> yeah. Start from the newest and work your way backwards, because that way we'll have time to upload the rest. Yes. Um... But, but seriously, thank you for listening. Thank you again to Galatea for being yes, our guest. This was fun. Um, and I would like us to close with you giving our sign-off to wrap us up. I'm so tempted to say it in statue. It's to not say it at all. Oh, it's not say it at all. <laughs> <laughs> just stand good night, everybody. <laughs> well, anyway, music is life, and life is good. Bloop, bloop, bloop.